been presented uh, in, in numerous Buddhist countries uh, in their own sort of perceptions. And this is a, a stone panel from the Sanchi Stupa where the Kapilvastu uh, palace is depicted with Maya Devi uh, with her dream of the elephant and how uh, the, more or less she leaves the, the palace. So this is of course a depiction of what Kapilvastu might have been uh, from the period when the Sanchi Stupa was built in the second. When we actually go to Lumbini, we find the archaeological remains uh, and uh, not very much remains there. The rest we sort of have to try to interpret. The forested area where Gautama Buddha was born. Uh, in the Lumbini area uh, of the, the ancient village, uh, we find remains of pottery, uh, but not much more remains. So we don't really understand what the architecture would have been that, at the time. It was possibly uh, one would fabricate in a certain area uh, and transport into the, the village. Uh, we have the Harappan culture where we have uh, bricks found, but uh, pre-Morian bricks, this is the only place actually that uh, this has been uh, found. And this indicates some kind of, of a, a structure, sort of a platform that was built around the tree. Uh, and this is the, probably the oldest brick that uh, was found in uh, this area. During the Morian period, through the archaeology, uh, we can possibly find this uh, a kind of a shelter that was built around this tree shrine uh, with, again, timber posts. But we found uh, the investigations are still going on what tree this could have been. They found uh, remains of the root, but uh, this is, again, a very delicate uh, discussion on what tree might have been there. Um, on the other hand, we have Kapilvastu, which is known as Tilorakut. Uh, here, this area is uh, defined by uh, an archaeological site that was not properly investigated for a long time, and only recently uh, has uh, sort of a non-destructive survey been carried out with very interesting results, where we find that uh, the site does not only uh, is not only uh, within this uh, fortified area, but that there were suburban developments around uh, the, the, the main fortified area. Uh, these investigations go back to the late 19th century, where even the fortifications, the earliest ones were timber uh, fortifications uh, with timber posts, where we find post holes, which were then covered with earthen mounds and later on uh, brick uh, fortification walls were built. Uh, so this indicates that there was a progressive development of this settlement and possibly the posts were there uh, uh, at the time of uh, Buddha's life. So the question is that, which keeps coming up, the brick structures were much later developments, but we have clearly indications of what was there uh, during uh, Buddha's lifetime. Um, these early structures there, uh, we found a sort of a palatial structure there where we have um, a, a clearly identified inner wall with a gate, uh, which means there was some kind of a more important structure within this uh, Tilora Coat area. Uh, and again, this needs to be further investigated. However, uh, again, the discussion of what was actually built within, the, uh, within these uh, main fortified areas, whether there really was uh, a palace or the palace uh, of uh, uh, where Gautama Siddhartha lived or not, that again needs further uh, investigation. However, uh, within the fortification there are sort of grid-like developments, so there was really an area that was 
uh, planned out in grid form and uh, there were houses, so there was residential areas with uh, the main plinth being out of brick, uh, but most of the structures, the, the, the superstructure was out of uh, timber posts and uh, possibly a lot of them had uh, tile roofing. So we have a highly uh, sort of uh, built up area within these uh, fortifications where in a slightly later period decorative brickwork was used. So there's a sort of a, a basic understanding of this early architecture of this area which, uh, which developed initially out of uh, uh, timber posts with tile roofing but then using brick uh, into the middle of the first millennium. Um, now, in between uh, the, the 15th and the 19th century, uh, this whole area was lost. Uh, and we aren't quite sure what the reason was. It could have been climate change, it could have been that there was flooding there, but it also could be the change in religious uh, developments in the area. Here, this was what was found by Kadka Shamsher in 1896, together with uh, Führer from the Archaeological Survey of India. And uh, they found the Ashokan pillar, which then there was an inscription. They read this and found that this was uh, Lumini. Um, at the time, there was only a little shrine. Uh, over the next decades removed a large part of the archaeology, destroying a lot of the evidence of the area, and built the first temple. So this temple became what we sort of still sort of recognize as the original Lumini, even though it is from the 1930s, uh, in an architecture which, well, it doesn't really represent any specific style, but it was white plastered. Uh, a platform, so it was not a, a building, but with a platform uh, over the archaeology with a shrine on it. Um, and this was the, the state until the 1990s when the Japanese came to excavate the area and removed this temple. Uh, the problem now was that we had an archaeological site which was exposed. Now do we cover it up again or what do we, how do we protect this area? Uh, the other point was that we needed to bring uh, visitors uh, to be able to see this. And uh, there was a lot of designs prepared, uh, proposed. Uh, we also see that there are a lot of uh, smaller archaeological sites that need to be investigated. So it's really a Buddhist landscape uh, in this area. Um, the first real planning took place in the 1970s. Uh, uh, with support from the UN and Kenzo Tange, of course, the plan, Kenzo Tange's uh, master plan uh, for Lumbini. There was uh, a one sort of a, an area which is uh, the one by three mile, the central area, uh, which was um, the, the project area. The land was actually bought, removing seven villages from this area. And uh, this area has been planned out at, more or less according to uh, Kenzo Tange's plan. But the plan also included a restricted area on either side and a larger uh, agricultural sort of a buffer zone around the, uh, it. So it was a five by five mile plan which was never implemented. And now we have a municipality there doing municipal planning we have uh, a, a plan prepared by Dr. Kwak, uh, a Korean planner, with his own concepts for this planning. So there's layers of planning going on around the sacred garden, and the government is actually supporting all the plans, even though they uh, cannot all be implemented at the same time. So there's actually a, a major confusion uh, on what is actually going to be implemented, and in the meantime, nothing is being implemented, and there's just development taking place which is really not uh, controlled at all. Um, Kenzo Tange's architecture was based on, I was told, uh, on the sort of the Central Asian Buddhist uh, cave monasteries. And uh, this was developed over a, a larger period. 
But it's interesting that uh, Kenzo Tange and Karl Prusha were actually friends. And uh, there was this other structure built in Kathmandu, actually before uh, the buildings in Lumbini. The question is who, who designed it and where did the designs come from? And uh, uh, so the Taragaon Resort, but we all actually know Lumbini to be the, the work of Kenzo Tange. So even there we have little conflicts and uh, we aren't quite sure uh, what went on in that air period. Uh, however, Kenzo Tange did develop a larger plan for Lumbini, uh, which started with uh, uh, the new Lumbini village. You had the cultural uh, sort of center. You had a monastic zone with the Theravada uh, mon monasteries on the one side and the Mahayana uh, ones on the other. You had uh, meditation centers, which then led to the sacred garden. So you were actually preparing yourself through this process while you moved towards the sacred garden to prepare yourself also uh, spiritually uh, before coming into the most important part of the, the site. Um, now the interesting thing is in the monastic area, uh, the idea was that each country, Buddhist country, would get a plot and they would present their type of monastery architecture within the monastic area. However, it didn't quite work out that way because you had some countries like Myanmar that have a very distinct national identity linked to Buddhism and their architecture. Uh, but then you had a, a lot of other Buddhist uh, for example, we have uh, the, the Korean temple. According to the regulations, you can only build three-story. But each of these tiers uh, are three-story in itself. So the, the, the Korean temple is actually nine-story tall. So you already again have the competition of who's building taller and who's going to build more elaborate structures around there. Uh, we have... Uh, a Chaitya, uh, more or less a Chaitya design on top of a monastery. We have stupas, which are halls underneath. Uh, and we have a bahal that was built in one and a half times the scale uh, which uh, uh, it is uh, located in Kathmandu. So you have all these very interesting interpretations of symbols or designs, but totally changed in this new context. And uh, the question really is, is uh, what are we actually representing here? You know, is this uh, an art, a Buddhist architecture or how are we actually presenting ourselves uh, in this new context? Uh, one of the newest uh, projects that hasn't been built, uh, this plot is the one closest to the Sacred Garden. There was a, a sort of a New Age Buddhist group from California uh, that was actually going to build uh, pyramidal, like uh, pyramid-shaped structures, and all the delegates actually visited California, but that fell through. Uh, and this is the newest design uh, for one of the monasteries uh, in this area. Uh, the question is, you know, uh, I think it's it's sort of a very interesting design. However, the question arises, does this really correspond to what was uh, proposed in the master plan? Uh, then, of course, to develop the tourism in the area, we have a new uh, airport uh, being built in uh, Bhairava. And uh, this is, of course, very good. It helps decentralization. It helps the tourists come to, to the Lumbini area. Uh, and I, when I visited the, just recently, I just realized, I mean, I was wondering who designed uh, this airport. Uh, again, I wouldn't say it's not nice. Probably it's a very nice design. But who, I don't know who designed it and what it has to do with, uh, with... So the question is, how are we going to, you know, is this the right kind of architecture in that area? We started the planning for the Greater Lumbini area, looking at development indicators. We had the challenges of uh, education, health, forestry. We had the potentials of farming, road density, cultural heritage, which then really indicates that we should actually be focusing on cultural tourism and farming to help 
improve the social uh, situation in uh, the area uh, and really looking at the, 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 the local culture there. And uh, very little has actually been done to understand the local culture. Most of the development that's taking place are ideas and concepts that are being imposed on the area. If we look at tourism, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, Angkor, uh, which has uh, too many visitors. Just recently, they have been trying to reduce the number. Uh, if we look at Lumbini, uh, these numbers are increasing. Uh, you know, we're talking about 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. What's the impact of all these visitors to the area? And uh, one of the ideas w uh, was also to look at, uh, for example, the planning in Bagan was to look at an area 100 by 100 kilometers as an area where we develop for your two, three, four million visitors to come that they don't all get focused on a small uh, piece of area. Angkor is also a larger area. So if we look at um, Lumbini, that we, uh, you know, that we have a, a, a relatively large area where we disperse the tourists and that not, you know, we don't try to fit two million people just coming to Lumbini into the sacred garden area. So we need to look at a much larger area with a Buddhist circuit. Uh, the problem has been that we have an industrial corridor which is right uh, in the middle of our uh, planning area. And for example, this could be moved towards the west where we have the corridor in Krishnanagar. Uh, but again, this coordination between the planners and those who want to develop uh, or conserve this uh, Buddhist uh, landscape uh, needs to improve. Uh, again, uh, the planning within each of the sites, this is uh, Kapilvastu. We have uh, zoning plans uh, prepared um, where we are trying to protect the area. Uh, tourism development within the site with uh, sort of footpaths and platforms and interpretation. Uh, so this needs to be developed uh, nearby, recently, the Kapilvastu Museum uh, was built. Uh, sadly, I have to admit, I started the original sketches, but my sketches were taken by the, the, the government engineer who interpreted my sketches in his own way and uh, designed this structure in uh, using Dachiapa, sort of it's a you know, a, a concrete structure my, and uh, covered with uh, Newari style uh, designs, which has absolutely nothing to do with the culture in Tilorakot. But again, this misconception that anything we, which is sort of traditional Newari uh, is culturally appropriate, uh, we need to really get away from that and find a language that is res uh, uh, sort of correct for uh, the area. And on the other hand, we have a local tradition which, uh, for example, these Taru uh, villages, which really has a character which is so, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's something that we really need to understand and develop. And uh, if we are going to develop this area for tourism, we need to try to identify, you know, what are the, the local uh, uh, the characteristics of this area and develop things, uh, architecture along, uh, along sort of a locally adapted uh, way. So, more or less, this is the end of my presentation. I believe that we have, uh, you know, the developments that's going on uh, in and around Lumbini, a lot of it is actually designed by architects. Until 2007, when we celebrated our 50th anniversary. As a city, okay, it's multicultural, multiracial. And if you look at the data that we have over here, in terms of community, okay, 45%, which is less than 50%, are the Mumutra or the Malays. Then you have the Chinese, which is 43, almost equal. And in terms of age group. And as a city, Okay, and it's also known as a Federal Territory of Kuala Lumpur. Okay, 243 uh, kilometers square. It has actually 11 uh, sort of sectors, which is actually based on the parliamentary allocation.
Okay. Just a bit on tourism before we go into the details based on my paper. Without doubt, tourism is one of the most important sectors in any industry. In 2017, this industry has contributed 14.9% to the national economy compared to 10.4% in 2005. And the number of employees engaged in tourism industry has actually increased from 3.4 million in 2017 to 1.5 million in 2005. And the number of people employed in the tourism industry make up 23.2% of the total labour cost. That's how important the tourism industry is. Okay, Kuala Lumpur city centre itself. In Kuala Lumpur itself, we have what we call the oldest Malay residential area, which is Kampung Baru. Okay, I'm not again. I'm not going to go into details, but this is the only enclave until today is still the village. Okay, its own, and because of the law, the land belongs to the Malay uh, uh, race, and you have all the traditional housing that have that and look at that with the twin towers in the background so in terms of land bank Kampong Baru is actually a gold mine okay and of course I will also go into details how it's going to develop the controversy that goes around it I'm losing my 20 minutes just on the thing itself and we have what we call the area called Petaling Street, which is known as the Chinatown of Kuala Lumpur. But for those who have visited Chinatown lately, we have a lot of Nepalese there, especially during the weekends. And we also have the enclave of Brickfield, okay, which is known as Little India. So every year when you have the Diwali or Dipawali celebration, that's the main area where the celebration is held. And Medan Pasa, which is in those days known as the financial sector of Kuala Lumpur, okay, it still retains a lot of the old heritage building. And the bottom slide okay, shows how he has been developed and patronized uh, pedestrianized into an area that is actually very popular with the tourists. And recently, because Kuala Lumpur is actually founded at the confluence of two rivers, okay, the government has actually embarked an area to develop what you call the river of life, just not the uh, river itself, but the parameters of the areas, how it's actually developed to be a tourist spot. And although I mentioned it's only 200 years old, okay, like anything else, we also believe in what we have. And that's how the uh, City Hall and also the Ministry of Federal Territory try to actually develop Kuala Lumpur as a heritage city. Although comparative to Georgetown, Penang or Malacca, which is UNESCO recognized city, we are pretty new. And, of course, the whole area is actually developed, okay, and we also have, in terms of tourism, a heritage trail, okay, that actually concentrated on certain part of the city, which I will... Okay. In actual fact, the whole Kuala Lumpur city, in terms of heritage, uh, is subdivided between N1, which is Central Node, to N9, which is North Peripheral Area. And this portion of the city, which, oh, sorry, the Merdeka Stadium, where the independence was actually announced, the Merdeka Square where we have the Sultan Abdul Samad building and the old railway station 
Okay, so basically, buildings around this area, okay, is contiguous and contain groups of buildings gazetted under the National Heritage Act. Then we have the uh, other areas, the uh, other zones, which I will not elaborate. Okay, pre-independent. Okay, the building that is actually built before 1957, you have the old city hall. Okay, and if you look at the architecture itself, okay, it's basically anglo mughal architecture, which is very common in Kuala Lumpur itself. Same thing with the uh, Slangor Secretariat in the earlier part and subsequently when Malaysia gained independence, that's where the city hall was held. And prior to the, uh, what they call, building of the Twin Towers, this is actually the image of Kuala Lumpur. So maybe the older generation who have visited Kuala Lumpur will always remember this particular building. The old railway station. This building, although it's a residential uh, house, why I actually showed this slide because this is where the Institute Malaysia Institute of Architects used to be located. For those who are familiar, that's where we were located for many, many years. And at the moment, the government has actually embarked on the conservation to the whole uh, building and it's owned by the uh, City Hall. And now it became a venue of all uh, functions and activities whereby anyone can actually rent it. And of course, the mosque, which is actually at the com uh, uh, confluence of the two rivers. We have the old palace, which is now the, uh, what they call the Royal Museum. The oldest Indian or Hindu temple in Kuala Lumpur, the Chinese temple. And basically, okay, because it's very diverse in a lot of aspects, so it's not only about heritage, it's also about religion and postmodern architecture. After 1957, okay, we had this identity crisis, what is actually the national identity. Okay, so we were looking into what's actually the identity that we are looking at. And of course, this uh, what I call stadium which was built, okay, we just basically have this very simple because we are lacking of fines at that point of time. The parliament, okay, basically is more looking into how a building corresponds to the environment, uh, the uh, climate. The national mosque. Okay, previously most of the mosques you normally have the dome, but this particular mosque. Okay, when we are looking into uh, what they call the uh, identity, so if you note that the dome is actually is the shape of uh, uh, what they call um, umbrella. Okay, and at one point this became very popular, and every other mosque have that. Okay. So again, it's an identity crisis. What is actually uh, truly uh, national? Five more uh, yesterday, a lot of them were given more time. Okay, uh, I'll try. <laughs> and you know how architects are. <laughs> okay, and after that, okay, it's all about symbolism. Okay, from uh, looking into national identity, we're looking into symbolism. And there were a few buildings that look at uh, this library, for example, the symbolism is actually the head here. Okay. So whether it's agreeable among architects or not, we, we won't discuss. Uh, the uh, premium uh, board, okay, which is actually a piggy bank. The uh, biggest, uh, what they call bank, which is actually from the trees. The national, and of course the twin towers. I uh, will quickly go, okay. And unfortunately, in Malaysia, we always think about what's the tallest, what's the biggest. 
Although earlier we are talking about symbolism, which actually ties back to the culture or whatever, these two buildings, which one is already uh, completed, okay, the other one is still under construction, okay, it can be anywhere. It can be Singapore or any other country. Okay, same thing we just completed recently, the Exchange uh, 106, and conservation and modernity. Okay, back to Kampung Baru. Okay. This is only recent, I think last couple of months. Okay, the government has actually embarked to develop the whole area, which is that, into, well, the high rise there. So it is very controversial. Okay, again, okay, I, I, I'm not too sure whether this project will actually embark, and of course, the uh, part on the other part. And as I arrived uh, two, uh, two days back, visit, I noticed big signboard visit Nepal. In the actual fact, we are also having visit Malaysia year 2020, which is coincidentally next year, okay? And the theme is actually visit truly Asia, because Malaysia has always actually uh, commend that we have all the communities. In fact, in Kuala Lumpur itself, we have little Nepal, we have little Myanmar, we have uh, little uh, uh, Philippines, that sort of thing. And the key part that I want to mention over here, Visit Malaysia here actually has uh, bringing a lot of uh, tourists to Malaysia itself, okay? And that's some of the data that I portrayed. And before I embark on the conclusion, okay, or the conclusion is just not about Kuala Lumpur itself. It's also about Kamandu or any other cities. Because at the end of the day, you are the stakeholders. This is your country. This is your city. First, you need to decide what you want to do, what you want to embark. You can call any competition, you can call any foreign consultant in, but the most important thing is you need to know what you want. And these are few, four pointers that I would like to raise. One is actually related to authorities. There's a proper design guideline need to be made. Okay, this is where the government comes in, okay, and try to actually incorporate local identity in a sense, thus improving the uh, tourism aspect. Because at the end of the day, tourists come to the country because of a certain reason. We want to look into the cultural aspect, the heritage aspect, something that is not common with other cities in the world. And at the same time, to promote laws on conservation and re adaptive reuse, which can encourage preservation of heritage building and site, encouraging engagement with the stakeholders on the guidelines, place making creative and effective advertisement and promotion, which I'm sorry to say, this is what I felt when I first arrived at the airport. The signages and whatnot with regards to uh, visit Nepal wasn't that big. Okay, this is maybe when the government wants to promote, you need to look into the bigger aspect of that. We're almost towards the end. Oh, okay, I have to share this, okay? Something that the former Premier of Singapore mentioned. We made our share of mistakes in Singapore. For example, in our rush to rebuild Singapore, we knocked down many old and queen Singapore buildings. Then we realised we were destroying a valuable part of the cultural heritage that we were demolishing what tourists found attractive and unique in Singapore. That's where I mentioned, don't invent the template, learn the mistakes from the other countries or cities. And two more quotes. Oh. A city without old buildings is like a man without a memory. A city without street life is like a woman without a smile. And you try to guess when a woman doesn't have a smile, okay? Thank you very much. You know, the altitude range from 3,000 to 6,000 meters, and the settlements are situated between 3,000 up to four, almost 4,000 meters. The climate is very dry, very cold in winter, and um, very little rain. So, because of the climate and um, also the um, because of the climate, the, la the landscape is very unique. 
So the total area of Lomanta, uh, Upper Mustang is about 2,500 uh, square kilometer. There, are, there are about 20, even though there are about 27 uh, settlements, some of them are the settlement have only one or two, you know, houses. Some of the settlement come, uh, are made of, and uh, the total population is five, is about 6,000. But uh, one interesting fact is the the number of household and the population in Upper Mustang is, is decreasing. Over the years, that is mainly uh, due to the out-migration of youth to big cities and also abroad for uh, employment opportunity, economic opportunity. And also another factor is the younger generation going to cities, to Pokhara and Kathmandu for education. And usually when they leave, they don't come back to the region. And the people of uh, Mustang or uh, Upper Mustang are, you know, Tibetan, basically. They're et uh, ethnically, culturally linked with, uh, are closer to Tibetan. And uh, they practice Tibetan Buddhism. And they call themselves Lowa. And uh, the language is called Loba, which is very, it, it is a form of uh, Tibetan dialect. So historically, uh, Loma, uh, Upper Mustang was linked with um, Western Tibet and Ladakh. So the evidence of the intercultural actions uh, since historical time is evidence in the form of uh, this uh, mural painting that are found in the monasteries and also in old uh, Tibetan scriptures. And um, the cultural heritage are found in the form of um, cave which, uh, which are either monastery or, res you know, cave for habitual cave. And, um, and um, there are many monasteries and some of them date back to 11th century. So basically, these are the, like, the cultural heritage that are found. And another very important aspect of the cultural heritage is the way of life of the people in Abba Mustang. Um, the, the festivals that, that are ce celebrated there and the, the culture that are followed by the people which, are, which has uh, continued since um, you know, centuries. Um, Mustang became completely isolated from both north and south in the 50s due to the political region in, you know, on the Tibet side and um, due to that because Initially, the, the economy of Loman, uh, Mustang, let's say, well, relied on the, the trade between India and um, Tibet. So once it was closed, it, the, it, can, it became almost like a standstill in terms of economy. The, the agriculture is very, very limited because of the climate and the rainfall. There is only one crop, and basically the occupation of the inhabitants are animal hus husbandry, uh, agriculture, very few crops, and the, uh, with only one planting season, which is uh, limited from April to September, and, um, and limited trade. So uh, this is until tourism was introduced. And, um, but because of the isolation and also the remoteness of the place, it was able to maintain, I think, to, to preserve the, the unique cultural heritage and uh, was due to the isolation of uh, this place for more than, you know, five decades. So, so these features, you know, which has been preserved are, uh, you know, are basically the, the reason why tourism has been uh, introduced in this place. And um, the the, it is, you know, in the Western world, uh, Abba Mustang is very popular. It's also because, it, because it's, it's known as one of the last remnants of authentic Tibetan culture, which are, you know, re, um, you know slowly disappearing on the other side in Tibet. So the wall city of Lomantang, this is like uh, the capital of uh, the kingdom of Lo, which is known. And the settlements, um, uh, the Lomantang, is a wall settlement with about eight meter high wall and uh, three major monastery and a palace. So this, it's a very compact settlement and uh, this is uh, very typical of all the uh, larger settlement in uh, Upper Mustang, which are all built very close to the water source because water is very scarce in, uh, in this area. 
So, and the settlement are usually uh, located where water can be easily brought for irrigation. And religious consideration as the, uh, the basic factor defining the, you know, the, the layout of the city. The monastery, their main monastery and the, uh, the houses are built around the monastery. In the case of Lomantang, since it was also the cap, uh, political cap, capital, the, the palace is also the center of the city. And there's always the circumambulatory path around the monastery and then the houses. It's not a planned city as such, but there was some kind of planning that influenced the layout of the city. And the houses are, of course, like uh, built with uh, locally available ma material, er which are earth, timber, and stone. Timber is very, very rarely used and in, in very crude form. And another very, um, very specific character of the architecture of this region is the firewood that's like uh, stacked on top of the, par the par uh, parapet of the wall. And uh, initially this was used, but you know, with the road now, it, gas is easily um, you know, brought to the area. So this, became, this uh, firewood has become more like a decorative feature than you know, it's being used. And the facade are always painted in different colors and the colors are obtained from the hills in the surrounding areas. So you can see the layout of the Lomantang on the uh, side on your right. Initially it was a square, it, I mean, it can be guessed that it was a square plan and after adding the third monastery and, you know, it became an L shape, which is currently now. And it also shows like the city and the, the surrounding area, the agricultural field. And little bit you can see on this, the expansion of the city, which I will talk about soon. So the significance of Lomantang um, is not only the wall city and the monastery and the settlement, it's also the landscape around, which is which includes the agricultural land, the irrigation, uh, you know, canals, the, the you know, the an ancient ruins around the city. It's not only the built heritage, and it's also the culture, culture of the place, the, the living culture of the, uh, among them 90% are tourism infrastructure, but these are built without any proper planning. So, um, and uh, you, both of these hotels are the two most popular hotels. On the left one is the Royal Hotel, belong to the Royal Family, and on, another one is called Lotus Hotel. Both of these are built in concrete, uh, cement concrete. Concrete, the, of course, the Royal Hotel, because it's a star hotel, every room has a ace, you know, he heating. Heating to, um, so I'll quickly just end. Uh, but the, the concrete hotels are extremely cold inside, so, there are other so many, uh, and uh, let's just look at how the city is expanding now. The wall outside the wall city. This is a study we did like two years ago with student from Kopa uh, College. So, so you know, um, I just come to the conclusion. Lomantang still retains, you know, the landscape and the character of the settlement is still there, but. If we are not careful how the tourism goes in future, that's going to destroy what attracts the you know tourists in the first place. So that's all. And another, just you know, because I said proposal in my abstract, I was thinking why why do we need to build lodges all the time? Why can cannot you know we in innovate the kind of accommodation we can offer to tourists? Tourists come for experience. They don't come for luxury hotels. So if we can have these are nomad tents. If these tents can convert it into, you know, tent hotel, which you cannot get in any part of the other part of the world, I think that will be more, and these will be temporary. You can take them out and they don't impact the landscape. You can take them out in winter. So this is just basically my presentation. Thank you. I hope this will not be counted <laughs> in my 15 minutes. Uh, how do I go back? Okay. So I'll start with the short history of aviation. Mankind's passion for flight can be seen in stories of mythologies from different societies and religious texts. There is flying chariots in our Hindu mythologies and of course Icarus's wings and Ezekiel's wheel on Christianity and Islam. Uh, coming to modern aviation, it started when the Wright brothers invented 
fully manned and controlled flight in 1903. Then we have developed uh, transatlantic flights and then commercial jet planes started and now we're in the... Now we actually have space tourism. You can actually pay $35,000 to go visit the space for recreational purposes. So for your next vacation, think about that maybe. So soon maybe we'll be uh, designing airports on different planets and their moons. But for now, let's come back to the Earth and the global context of the airports. We can see that uh, before the 1930s, the airports were designed more for leisure activity than for world transportation. And it can be seen in the designs with ob observational decks and restaurants that, were, that would cater more visitors than for passengers. Uh, these are some uh, old photos of the Heathrow Airport. You can see the runway, uh, state of the runway. It is just a flat land. Uh, and there are puddles due, due to the rain. And the uh, first photo is of the uh, tents that were used as passenger terminals in the early days. Uh, however, with development in technology, the airports have evolved with increase in complexity and scale. And now they are the backbone of the world transport and necessity for the trade and commerce. Uh, it is also the face of nation. The first impression we make of a country is from when we step down from the airplane and uh, enter the airport, it should offer everything that the country has to offer, the culture and the diversity, it should be seen in the airport. And it is also a center for the global cultural flow. Uh, now, the airports are not just infrastructures, but they are a standing landmark that shows the architectural and technological feat that uh, we have reached right now. And coming to the national context of the airports, our only operational uh, international airport, the Tribhuvan International Airport, was established 70 years ago. And while it was an exemplary feat at its time, it is now overburdened and we can hear con constant complaints from passengers, tourists and even local people about the congestion and air traffic here. Uh, the original design was done by a Canadian firm and it was a reflection of the traditional Nepali architecture with the exposed bricks and carved wooden elements and the Godavari marble flooring. However, this is a very strong statement that I read. Our only international airport is so congested, it is choking our tourism in industry. So it is really important that the first impression that people have of Nepal when they get to the airport should be a good one and not that of a congested one. So there, these are just some uh, newspaper clippings that I had that before visit Nepal 2020, uh, the, our country really needs to improve airport management. But uh, there have been upgrades on the uh, uh, existing airport and two new airports are coming up. So I hope that 2020 will not be chaotic and we can show our, uh, our culture in our uh, airports in the future. So some upgrades and proposals uh, made for uh, the airports for Visit Nepal 2020 are the expansion of the Tribhuvan International Airport. Uh, in, this, in this, in this uh, figure, you can uh, see the ongoing improvement uh, uh, of the runway expansion and hangar upgrades and taxiway expansions. And some uh, short-term and long-term expansions too. This is one of the proposals for the Tribhuvan International Upgrade done by Group ADP, which is based in Paris. And uh, it's a new terminal building uh, with a VIP terminal, maintenance hangars and everything. And it is a design concept is of combining the modernity and respect for Nepal's natural environment. It aspires to be uh, an example of sustainable development and the dynamic roof are uh, the reflection of the surrounding peaks of the valley. While this is a very good design, uh, we are also concerned of, of course, something that was pointed out by Mr. Kai uh, the cultural relativity of this design to the valley. Um, another international airport being developed is the Gautam Buddha Airport. Um, it is going to be a gateway to the birthplace of Gautam Buddha Lumbini. And of course, I will not go much into the design details of this. Uh, it was also uh, discussed briefly by Mr. Waisi. 
Uh, it's going to be Nepal's first green airport and it's going to be fully solar powered. So it's a very good step towards sustainability. Sustainability and it's going to, of course, like you know, reduce pressure from the existing airports and start an socio-economic evolution to the west. <clears throat> Another uh, international airport being developed is the Pokhara International Airport, which is going to be the aerial gateway to the Himalayan regions of Nepal. Pokhara is already a um, tourist destination, and it's the start point of trekking to different um, uh, different. Um, Annapurna region of the Nepal. So its annual capacity is going to be 1 million and it will of course be a new step towards the infrastructure development of our country. Now we come to Nijgarh International Airport. I'm sure that everyone from Nepal is familiar with this topic and the controversy surrounding it. Uh, for our international delegates, uh, this is the site for our new airport. It's uh, it's an existing forest area, so I'm just trying to put perspective into it that the Nijgar, instead of this lush greenery that you see right now, there have been proposals of an airport and an airport city in this uh, space. Uh, from all the problems of congestion and air traffic we are facing right now, the necessity of the new airport cannot be denied. However, uh, Nepal is known for ecotourism and uh, destroying a major natural forest habitat for tourism development seems very paradoxical and we really have to think that whether this is the right decision for Nepal or not. Nijgar has been called many things by the government officials. It's been proposed as the largest airport in Asia. It's not just going to be an airport but a transit hub and a game changer for Nepal's economy. However, environmentalists have also gone so far as to call it an ecological crime as uh, it's a part of the Persa, um, Persa National Park buffer zone and it's going to destroy a major chunk of the migratory corridor of the existing wildlife. And of course, Mr. Popo called us the Instagram generation yesterday and uh, a few months back, uh, these two hashtags, save Nijgarh and hashtag Binas Binakubikas, which means development without destruction. These were flooding uh, the social media and that's how the youth have also been involved in protests against the Nijgarh airport. Uh, this is the uh, proposed master plan with the, with the uh, airport on one side and airport city on the other side. And the, however, the airport area is going to be 1,300 hectare and airport city is going to be 600 hectare. But the impact area uh, is going to be 8,000 hectares because just constructing an airport in the middle of the forest is not going to be a solution. Uh, we have to make buffer areas. And so considering all that, the impact area will be 8,000 hectares and it will cater 15 million passengers. There are a lot of controversies and political issues and environmental issues going on through this, but I will not go into those issues because that's going to take all day. <coughs> These are some of the newspaper clippings about the flawed assessment and how the min uh, tourism minister has repeatedly said that Nijgar Airport is uh, will should be built at any cost and how. Uh, the environmentalists have said, uh, asked for alternative sites for Nijgar. And most recently, the Supreme Court uh, has asked the government to halt the plans for Nijgar Airport. But uh, I've still been reading articles about how Nijgar cannot be avoided. Um, whenever we talk about the Nijgar Airport, there is always this argument that goes development versus environment. Because... Um, <clears throat> Many people who are against the airport uh, have been uh, have been uh, claimed to be against development, but I like to clear that and it, that is not the case because development is necessary, but we have to uh, we have to know to what extent, to what cost the development comes. So instead of uh, seeing this as development versus environment, I think we should all work together and not just the architects 
but also the environmentalists and the government uh, government officials. We should all work together to get development with environment. Now, I'll briefly talk about the case studies, but due to the time constraint, I'll not go into the detailed planning, but I'll only be focusing on the sustainable features of some airports. Of course, we can, we can uh, not... Uh, you have five minutes left now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so first to talk about the Changi Airport. Uh, Changi is the most popular airport right now and the one of the most busiest. After the newest addition, the Jewel, uh, it has uh, gained a lot of the world attention for, for sustainability and for the, um, as a really good destination in itself. And uh, some sustainable features are the natural green space, both in outdoor and indoor. Uh, in outdoor and indoor spaces, their utilization of natural light and even natural ventilation has been maintained. Uh, to go to the Heathrow Airport, it is one of the busiest airport and still they have maximized the natural light and they, have, they are improving access to green spaces and uh, close proximity has been maintained between the terminals and the runway to cut carbon emission. Uh, Zurich Airport is uh, the this airport is very interesting because uh, a large part of this airport is a uh, part of a con nature conservation area. So I think we can learn a lot from this. Um, conscious planning and landscaping has been done so that uh, and the impact on the environment is minimum. And of course, the recharge of groundwater and rainwater harvesting and all the sustainable elements have been added to this. And the Cochin Airport. <coughs> is the first fully solar powered airport in India and it also won the Champion of the Earth Award which is the highest environment honor instituted by the United Nations. Now the vision for a new airport in Nepal is an eco airport. Um, an airport is going to be a face of the nation and so it is really important that we show our culture and values in the airport and the warmth of the people of Nepal can be shown through good service and hospitality. Our tagline from which uh, the global, pe global uh, population knows us is naturally Nepal. So I think that instead of getting out from a plane and getting inside a box and looking at pictures of Nepal, we can experience nature firsthand. We are known for our ecotourism, so why not start from the airport? And, and cut out from the existing stereotype of airport and give nature-related activities like short hikes and seasonal fruit pickings and even conservation of some flora and fauna inside the airport and around it. And we can create spaces for authentic experience. Uh, of course, it's also uh, an airport is a commercial hub, but it is also a part of the community. and. We cannot uh, go to a site and decide on building an airport there without thinking of the community and the surrounding there. So it has to be a part of the community. Community has to be involved in all the decision making process and design process. Um, it's going to be an economic development, um, economic development a space for the community and we should so showcase their lifestyle and values there a part of the airport it can I think the sustainability can be maintained by following the basic building science that we've been learning from um, <clears throat> from a long time and by using natural light and maximum natural light and natural cross uh, ventilation and we should uh, are already a chunk of architecture and design scene for rural and urban modern Nepal we, we felt this uh, phenomena uh, while working uh, in master plan uh, of three lakes, which, uh, which two of them are uh, them in Manang, which is a uh, higher region, Himalayan region of Nepal, and uh, one is in Parai. Uh, so, basically, our project is our experience and knowledge and voice that we uh, gather from this project. 
we all know that destination with water is always been a nice nice spot to have a fun to have a go, uh, to uh, to have a uh, um, to go uh, to trek and on the other part we have we, from child we know that nepal is second largest country second richest country in water resources so we have many lakes so we have uh, uh, many uh, such water resources including lakes which are in some are some are in deteriorate condition some are uh, we, we can't we are not able to care them but if you package them uh, uh, if you if you manage them uh, we thought that it will be a nice destination for the tourist for the tourism uh, for the nepal so we came up with the vision of lake park for the uh, unique experience of place for leisure leisure and educational purpose okay uh, vision of lake park these were the three sites that we had worked in 2018 uh, uh, this big one this big picture Uh, uh, this was Gangapuna Lake, and uh, it was a very beautiful site. Here we can see uh, the Gangapuna Glacier, and uh, our site includes uh, this lake area and this parcel of land. Uh, another, another site was that. This, uh, this site was in Dukul Pokhari, which was uh, on the way to Manang. Uh, and this was a beautiful lake with lotus, and it was uh, in, uh, very near to Lumbini, a birthplace of Gautam Buddha. So, how can you create the unique experience of a uh, place? We thought that as an architect, uh, through planning, through designing, through our knowledge, we can create a unique image of site. Uh, so, uh, so for this uh, vision of Lake Park, for this uh, site, we come up with the uh, m proposed master plan. We propose the master plan. Uh, these were the ma uh, proposed master plan on these three sites, and uh, we can uh, see here. Uh, uh, this uh, this were the uh, master plan of uh, Danapur, uh, which was in uh, Tarai, uh, we, which is not another uh, village of Tarai. So uh, we can see here. This, uh, uh, this is uh, children uh, water park, and this is for lodging facilities, uh, which is, which we call homestay. And there we create a there we create a entrance. And this one, this big one, was view uh, tower. We place we we. Uh, uh, this th this was view tower. We call it thundering view tower. So when you come, uh, we place it in the uh, in the in the center of the site. So so when we uh, when one came from uh, uh, entrance and uh, it, it would be a wonderful thing to see here in the in in the mid of uh, jungle in the in the in the mid of lake. So on the on the right top corner, uh, this uh, this was the master plan we had proposed in Mana Gangapuna Lake area, which uh, okay there. Uh, these these were the lodging facilities. 
uh, which, which is orienting toward the glacier of Gangapuna. Uh, uh, so so there, there we, we try to create a small bazaar-like environment with little shops and, and this, this is a build deck we purpose there. So on the other side, there, there we proposed uh, 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 rock garden and there is, uh, this is a circle of juniper trees uh, for the playground, uh, for, for, the, for the play of, for the, for the children. And they, this, is the, this, this was the master plan that we had proposed for the Dukurpukri Lake area. And uh, we can see here the, uh, the tea house, visitor, inform visitor information centers, and there is, there is a toil toilet and we propose here a meditation center. So, oh, uh, so how this became a project, and uh, it was interesting uh, to say how the project became a project. One of our, uh, one of our, our partner uh, at ZAP, we are ZAP, uh, Jayendra and Partners Private Limited, so we, we, we better to call ourselves a Jap. Uh, uh, yeah. She has a connection with local leaders at Manang, and she managed a meeting at Kathmandu, and we went there with Jumbo Toli, with family. It was not easy to go uh, in Manang with uh, Jumbo Toli. So we went there, we visited side, we we, we experience the site, we, we walk around the site, we meet the, uh, we met the office, uh, government officer, local leaders, local people. So, we try to convince uh, uh, them, we, we try to listen to them, what they actually need. Uh, so, pure uh, Nepal style, we are not always here to sell, uh, sell for the tourist. Sing. And this, this scenario, this current trend of Nepal in the sector of tourism, uh, we take this as opportunity. This is a golden time to give a sign to our architecture uh, in more creative way. It's a time to inspire a uh, younger generation. So uh, this, uh, these were the master plan that we had proposed in uh, Gangapuna Lake area. Uh, we can see uh, the resort. First thing that we uh, had done in uh, uh, proposed in uh, Gangapuna Lake area. Gangapuna Lake uh, Lake was a drying lake, so we we have to propose. We have to revitalize. So we propose a gabin, low tech stone gabin wall and check them in various uh, portion uh, so that we can conserve. Uh, we we can uh, uh, avoid the siltations and we try to uh, ref. Uh, give a proper size of this lake. So along this lake, we propose a lodging facility uh, orienting toward the uh, 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 Gangapuna Glacier, so one can have a good view of, one can enjoy a, a good uh, uh, view of uh, Gangapuna Glaciers. On the hills, uh, we, try to we try to include our children, so we propose uh, uh, a, journey, a circle of juniper trees and a stone a rock garden with inscri inscription of uh, uh, culture and art uh, so that it, it provides a sense of bygone era. And we somehow we try to, uh, uh, this, uh, this one is beauty uh, uh, on the hill, on the little hillocks so that more than anything, it's an it's a icon of that place we, uh, we propose uh, so that one can view it from a distance. Uh, this, uh, this is the lodging facilities, so let's move on next slide. Uh, lodging facilities orienting towards the view of Gangapura Glacier. So this is the Kurpukri Lake area. People stop there for lunch, so let's try to uh, capture uh, 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 the opportunity of the site. So, so it was uh, dry. Uh, please conclude your presentation now, time is up. So this, uh, this, uh, this was a tea house, we propose here a dining. Dining all, uh, so Dukurpokhari uh, was an interesting site. So uh, we try to capture 
uh, the essence of the site. Uh, so we propose a meditation center here, uh, which is not like big meditation center. Uh, um, so it, it, we, we propose uh, with orienting to, towards the uh, Sargodari, uh, so that one can enjoy uh, our, our meditation uh, uh, to, uh, sitting towards uh, Sargodari. So, so this is uh, Danapur Lake Park. Uh, then we, uh, it, it was so near to the uh, Lumini, birthplace of Gautam Buddha. It was beautifully surrounded by uh, a forest, lake. So we tried to capture, uh, uh, capture the essence of the site. So we thought that we should uh, provide there a meditation space. So we provide meditation space here. And, this, uh, uh, and uh, there we propose, uh, uh, th this is an entrance gate. Instead of making huge gate, we try to infuse with uh, various uh, uh, with with different purpose or uh, uh, different uh, functions uh, office uh, gallery space and uh, gate. Uh, this is. Uh, so please uh, conclude the presentation now. Uh, from this homestay, we try to provide a sense of try. I have a conclu conclusion note. Uh, I believe I emphasized enough. Our architecture of tourism is a genre on itself. An honest effort from architecture and design community to get out of comfort zone of eclecticism of traditional or vernacular archi Nepali architecture will not only take architecture to new height, but will also preserve the dignity of our of the original for, from proliferation of cheap copy. Our response, master plan of vision of Lake Park, is not a negation of style, but a search for new direction towards the architecture response to the infrastructure building of tourism in Nepal. Having completed just recently the master plan for conservation and revitalization of natural lake in the Him high Himalaya in Tarai, a low land of Nepal, Ezzap, we believe we are uniquely positioned to be a part of this discourse on architectural response to tourism in Nepal, initiated by SONA, academician, Consultant and client, all is all is tend to benefit benefit for this. I and my co-author Raju uh, offer honest gratitude gratitude to Sona and hope to explore many more avenues illuminated by uh, concern and criticism generated by our works. Thank you. May I call upon the stage the president of Society of Nepalese Architect, Architect Anjumalam Pradhan, to. <coughs> to uh, felicitate him with the token of love and khada. Ladies and gentlemen, now we, uh, we, we will continue the session again. I would like to hand over the mic and the floor to our session chair, architect Biresh Shah, sir. Uh, this place is a very special place and I'm sure uh, as Sirish uh, kind of gave you the objective information and the research, it uh, just gives me a perfect blend where I do not get into that aspect and I will straight get into a visual essay of the place. Uh, this is in the Manang Valley and uh, this is a place that I've been working on. So. Uh, this is called the Braka village and uh, this place is a very special area which I'll share more about it. But my presentation I will kind of, uh, the framework for it is to give a little bit of the context, the landscape, the resources of uh, culture and heritage, the sacredness of this place and the connectivity and the spiritual aspect that really needs to be kind of thought out for the vision. This is not the Manang or Mustang Valley, but it was my first introduction to the mountains. This is in the uh, Everest area. You can see the Everest right there. When you are in a site like this, uh, like I've been uh, sharing in many presentations, uh, this place really humbles you. The spirit of design in Nepal comes about in a way that, you know, you learn to look at things, the natural materials that you see uh, as a vocabulary in our landscape gets more pronounced. 
So after uh, I did a few projects up in the Everest area, but uh, my journey to really uh, walk and see the city uh, started beginning. So I stay, uh, my house is close to Swembu and I climb Swembu every morning. And when you go up and look at the prayer flags and see the sunlight and see this kind of a visual, uh, you know, skyline, there is a kind of feeling that emerges. There is a place that I've patronized where I go there and spend some time. And I think if you get out of your professional focus and learn to look at things and appreciate things, there is a certain resonance that happens to you. Getting into the Manang and Mustang area, uh, this is the map of Nepal and uh, all of you know where Pokhara is and just above Pokhara you have the Muk Muktinath and the Mustang Manang area which is a very uh, interesting place. You have the big uh, giants, China and uh, India next to us and this region was really uh, next to the Tibet area. This place, uh, the sacredness of this place, uh, I don't need to describe it. I think the more you look at the visuals, I also have a short video at the end, which uh, you'll get a glimpse of it. It's linked by religion, culture and the history of Tibet. You see the colors, you see the landscape, you see the barren uh, uh, climate of it. The strategic uh, eminence or preeminence of this place is that uh, all the Himalayan region, you know, it was part of the trade route. There was one which went to the uh, Silk Route, the other is a uh, route to Tibet. So there is a certain uh, prevalent of the uh, trade that happened there. The barren landscape is very dry, very dramatic and very overwhelming. It kind of silences you and uh, there is a term which I like to call, it's a museum by itself. The stretches of the rugged lands, the prayer flags, the landscape fusing into the building that embraces the mountains. It, it kind of uh, shows you a character that is very different to what we see in the city. No doubt there is a difficulty for people living there in the harsh climate. There is a certain uh, difficulty to survive, but I think that's what gives them strength. When you are in a place like this, the spirituality or the sacredness is something that uh, when you just observe the mountains, when you learn to listen to the wind or take a walk and feel yourself, there is a certain connection that you have. The historical setting of uh, Mustang and Manang area, in short, it, it used to be a kingdom by itself, but then uh, over time when Prithvi Narayan Shah kind of included it within Nepal in the 1700s, and thereafter also it lay very isolated as uh, Sirish mentioned. But I will not get into too much of the historical aspect and get into, as I mentioned, more of the visual. There is a certain cosmic energy which uh, is very, very prevalent there, which needs to be harnessed. It looks as if time stood still and uh, there is a small population that inhabits the place. But when you connect, uh, it reminds me of Van Gogh's paintings where you, you look at the clouds and you look at everything in a little deeper sense. This is one of the last centers of the Tibetan civilization. Dalai Lama has said that Mustang is one of the few places in the Himalayan region that has been able to retain its traditional Tibetan culture unmolested. A place like this, like the Grand Canyon, we have it right here in Nepal. There are a great number of caves and there are places where people meditated, there are lakes and rivers that kind of flow down. The journey of the river from the mountains to the ocean, you can experience it there. So at one end there are all the tangible heritage that is linked with uh, the culture, Buddhism, tradition and the various behavioral patterns that uh, we see. And there's also the intangible heritage that is seen there of uh, music, of uh, craft, of uh, you know, things that, of prayers and of light. The villages that are there are in a certain pattern. For those of you who visited there, there is a certain pattern that is almost blending in. Though it looks isolated, yet in the evening when there is a moonlight and you see these images, it kind of haunts you and almost uh, says something more to you. 
So this is my favorite. In all my presentations, I put this question about identity. And Nepal, being the tourism here, we talk about you know, Buddha, we talk about the birthplace of Buddha, we talk about Pashupati Nath, we talk about the mountains, the landscape. So in a place like Mustang and Manang, what is our identity? You know, we look at all these old buildings and yes, the road has reached there and it's going to change very fast. So do we look at it as a gift or a precious inheritance or do we look at it as a burden? Uh, that's a question that resonates with a place like this. The place in, uh, in the Mustang area is not devoid of the guerrilla war. I don't know, uh, some of you may know that during the Cold War with the CIA dropping uh, arms, there were the campers that were there. So there were places in the caves where they used to hide these ammunition. And it was the nerve center of the Chinese guerrilla war. In a place like this, you almost can't think of war. You know, it's a kind of a paradox that uh, the CIA sent arms in this place, but it is a historical reality of this place. On the contrary, when you look at Tibet and see what uh, China has done to Tibet, there it is no longer the Shangri-La. It's like a mega city with a lot of buildings. And I feel that the accessibility, you know, if you look at Kathmandu from 1960 to 2019, within a span of 69 years, how it has transformed because of the accessibility because of cars, because of the vehicles, suddenly so-called density changes. And I would wonder if when you take a road up in the mountains, what the density would be over the years, very fast. These are, these are views of certain plateaus that are there. There is a Buddhist monk looking. And the more I go there, the less I want to build. And perhaps uh, in this presentation, I will show you very less buildings, more of reflection of the place as a museum in the wilderness. The connectivity that I mentioned about the road is fast changing the landscape. You have these bulldozers, which is becoming a common sight because of the road. The Kaligandaki corridor from the Tarai through Mustang to the Korala checkpoint is becoming a reality very soon. So there's gonna be a link. We always say that if China and India were linked with Nepal, we would prosper. But places like Manang and Mustang would kind of transform very fast. And I would like to urge uh, our forum uh, here to kind of have a vision for this place before it, it, it gets spoiled. You know, it's something that once you go there, you understand it. Once you just kind of, uh, you know, talk about it, perhaps you don't understand it. So the road that is coming into this Forbidden Kingdom is happening very fast. There are a lot of people uh, going there. And you have this highway that is ripping through the heart of Mustang. We have a lot of adventure tourism happening. The motorcycles, there are various uh, cars that are already, there's an increase in the traffic and people. So I wonder where, you know, it's not just uh, tourism. I think there is more to a place. You know, the Himalayas are not there everywhere. So how do we look at the Himalayas as just a, you know, tourism showpiece or should there be a more intrinsic experience to this place? You have uh, the mules that kind of take the transport up, but the road has, in a way, you know, you question the lifeline that is there in many ways. At one, you want to see there is a certain facility, but on the other hand, animals, nature, walking, a slow pace in time is, is something that is also, uh, we need to enjoy that. Five more minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, now, I'm, now I'll move very fast. So I'll just, just uh, the slides. So you can see these visuals up in the mountains, the resources and heritage that we see there are the lakes, and these are the natural architecture. There are temples and passes. There are these caves, which I think is an excellent opportunity of building less and utilizing this, perhaps with a little glass in the front, but not building another structure and having you know, uh, hotels and resorts and lodges within this place. These caves are uh, very interesting and uh, this is the project in Braca and uh, I'll show you more of that. But the whole place, when I say it's a museum, you see all the fossils that are there. There is the migrating pattern that happens and there are people that go up. So it's, it's very high and it's very dry. Like uh, Sirish pointed out, very less water. 
So the challenge is really to see, you know, with all our information about what is happening in the Himalayan region of Ladakh, of, you know, Sikkim, of Tibet, the quest to modernity, are, we also are getting to see buildings like this. And when you see buildings like this, that are coming up there, without any kind of thought, you wonder which is the direction we're really heading. So the place is a kind of barometer for climate change. You have a problem of garbage that is already generated in various areas. Uh, I will not go into these case studies, but you know what uh, Sonam Wangchuk is doing in uh, Ladakh, it's an interesting exercise which we can look. Bhutan's philosophy of putting happiness above economic uh, prosperity and development is also something which uh, we should reflect on. Uh, the national happiness is, uh, I think, should be an important ingredient. And linking the vernacular tradition with technology is something that is very pronounced here in, uh, in, in Manang and Mustang. The Oroville uh, exercise in Tamil Nadu with the Earth Center is something which we can learn. We can have an Earth Center up in the mountains in this area. Uh, this project, Braka, this is the one which I've been working on and we've tried to maintain and keep it uh, as, uh, as it exists in a certain way. But the, the beauty of this is that, uh, you know, you have this river, people have left all this fertile land for the farming and they have built in this high areas to protect themselves from the wind. And I think it's a beautiful uh, kind of uh, lesson for us that the river which kind of brings the fertility of the land, if we misuse it, then where is the fertility of the soil? So these are a few uh, views of it. Uh, this is the way the Braca Resort is coming up. And also the visual uh, essay that I was talking to you, the simplicity is something that is very beautiful in this place. Uh, Kagbeni, the way the settlement hugs, uh, you know, the farming around and the river. Uh, these are the spiritual sacredness that you start experiencing. The buckwheat, uh, the, when it snows again, this barren places, you know, some parts of it which are close to the Annapurna, there are places where uh, Milarapa meditated. So there are a distinct kind of, you know, your senses get tickled. And this is one of my poetry, I wouldn't get into it. Uh, this is where uh, Milarapa meditated. And there are places where you walk up to Tilicho. I'm sure a lot of our youngsters have been doing it. When you go up there and just learn to see things and listen and feel, it's very special. So uh, just move on with this. We all have places where there is no memory of the past or future. Complete presence and present. These are your sacred energy places. Cherish them. I think up there you suddenly feel you're disconnected with time. The, there are various colors and concepts that this place kind of uh, spells out. The final vision is that I would feel that, you know, more than doing new buildings, this whole area should be treated as a living landscape museum. You know, if we understand, you know, we go to the Smithsonian Museum, we go to, we have a, a live museum right with us. But the more we architects and engineers try to kind of do, build too many things, I think that sacredness would kind of, you know, dissolve. So there are definitely institutions which kind of uh, make this understanding to the people that needs to be established. Very special play of uh, light and stone and, you know, earthy materials. The adventure tourism is something that is happening. The agro-tourism is also taking shape. The humble settlement with this majestic mountains kind of give you a feeling of, uh, you know, to me, it's like reaching New York. It's uh, arriving at a place which says so much. Uh, there are beautiful uh, houses which have very simple, you know, almost Tibetan and the mountain architecture for it. So last few slides about quality tourism and uh, the way culture, traditions and landscape should all come together and make the new history that we are creating. Yes, sir, sir. time is up. Okay. Uh, data of 2018, the uh, travel and tourism uh, contributed 4.9% to the GDP of Nepal. Um, if we see, uh, look at the 2017's data, we see that 70% of tourists visit to Nepal for holiday pleasure, and 15% visit for the pilgrimage, and 8% visit for uh, mountaining and tra uh, trekking, whereas the remaining 7% visit for business, uh, business proper 
Official Activities Conference, ETC. Uh, as, uh, in 2017, almost 9,40,218 uh, tourists visited Nepal, out of which 80.9% arrived by air and 19.1% arrived by land. As Tribune, Tribune International Airport being the only international airport in Nepal, 80.9% uh, tourists traveling to Nepal will surely visit Kathmandu Valley. As we know that the valley is a um, living museum with diverse culture and lifestyle, art and architecture, colorful festivals and countless celebrations. And it, it houses seven world heritage sites within it. Ministry of Culture, and, uh, Culture, Tourism and Civil Aviation has uh, identified 100 destinations within Nepal, out of which 17 tourist destinations identified are around Kathmandu Valley. So, while uh, traveling to this destination, we certainly go, will go through the ring road. So, while, facilit so we have, while facilitating convenient transportation and tourism infrastructure around the ring road, at present will help increase the number and time of stay in the Kathmandu Valley. So the main objective of the paper is to study the probability of developing tourism infrastructure and transport facilities around the existing ring road. Uh, so the image of the Kathmandu Valley as an ancient culture city will be reflected with modern amenities. While we go through the uh, history of Ring Road, it was constructed uh, in 2035-36 uh, in, uh, in order to connect the peripheral areas and to ease the traffic congestion within the city core. It is 27.8 km long, passing through Kathmandu Metropolitan City and Lalitpur Metropolitan City. Initially, the right-of-way was 50 meter, and afterwards, it was, uh, 12 meter was added as a uh, service road through guided land development. Uh, at, now, at present, the expansion of ring road is going on, while well, first phase from Koteshur to Kalanki has already been completed and it has been extended to eight lane. And second, the second phase has started, so that you can see cutting of trees going on all around the ring road in this area. And third phase from Chavil to Koteshur will soon, be, uh, soon start after the completion of second phase. So this is the view uh, showing that uh, four-lane four road, which has been uh, somewhere, and in uh, Koteshur area, uh, eight-lane ring road. So we all know that it is a common physical infrastructure of city, not only of Kathmandu, but all over the world. It is the, uh, so uh, ring road provides image to the city and make it memorable by creating pathways, nodes, junctions, and landmarks by its side. But this ring road is missing such elements due to the lack of bylaws, land use plans, and planning norms. However, it, uh, such elements are found in our traditional cities and stri streets, which cre creates memorable, live livable built environment, encouraging the public social life at the junctions of the streets. So while we talk about the traditional cities, we see that in the, uh, we see three types of open spaces in our traditional cities, like Darwar squares, market squares, and residential squares. And we find that Dar Darwar square and market squares are found in the intersection of the road. The shape, size, degree, and enclosure of the elements within the open space were governed by the social and cultural activities of the people living around the space. This is one of the squares that we have, um, where we can see the social, um, social work or livelihood going on over there. Uh, so uh, we went through what is tour tourism infrastructure. Tourism infrastructure is bas basis for tourism development and utilization of existing destin uh, destination resource. It includes large number of services that is necessary to meet uh, the need of the tourist and increase satisfaction during their stay. So, uh, tourist infrastructure in general compri comprises of para-tourist infrastructure, typical tourist infrastructure and elements that cannot be classified like gastronomy, uh, sports, leisure, culture and entertainment. So, in order to develop, uh, develop uh, in order to give new direction in the tourism infrastructure of Ring Road, 
We went through the questionnaires like why, where, what, when, and how. So first of all, why tourism infrastructure was needed? The tourists traveling to the Kath, as we said, the tourists traveling to the Kathmandu go through the ring road, and so the main infrastructure which helps the interconnection between the tourists and the destination. The ring road misses the vibrant junction, which will uh, guide the tourists to the destination and uh, it, um, gives an identity of the city. Uh, where, now, where to develop the tourist infrastructure? As we as we went uh, went through the uh, ring road. We, uh, the destination that has been identified by the Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Civil Aviation, we found that uh, eight junctions, through, uh, six junctions through which uh, we, uh, tourists can lead to those places, and two, uh, two points like um, Kalam Kichok and Air, uh, Bus Park and Airport, where, uh, from where they enter to the Kathmandu Valley. So when the intervention is to be done, so this is, uh, we found that this is the right time uh, to intervene in Ring Road, so we can, de uh, we can develop the junctions, the junctions uh, to, uh, to put the identity of the city and incorporate it in the city. So what is the present scenario of the junction of the Ring Road? For this, uh, for this we did a SWOT analysis for two, two junctions, like Koteshore and Kalanki. So we, uh, how is it possible to put uh, tourist infrastructure in uh, in the open in the junctions that already existed and highly dense. So, what is the present scenario of Koteshwar? Uh, as we uh, we can see that it is a it is a center point a center point connecting uh, connecting uh, uh, the roads coming from Bhaktapur, Kathmandu, and Lalitpur. And the, uh, we can see that. Uh, being such a busy, busy point, we found we found that there is a um, like strength. Let let us see strength. The public amenities are already there in that in the junction, like public toilets, information centers, park, restaurants, and um, that has been developed by Kathmandu municipality. The people traveling to the eastern part of the country through BP Highway or visiting to the Bhaktapur are passing through this junction. The infrastructures like travel agencies, ticket counters, hotels, laws are already there, uh, there in around around the junction. So we, we find the police station and traffic traffic office clubs uh, club buildings around it. Airport be, air, airport is one of the uh, main infrastructure that uh, that has that has created the junction very important uh, important. So uh, we can find bus stops, bus stops that are also well developed, but little bit uh, to be managed. Overhead breeze. So uh, when we went through the weakness, uh, the lanes that come in, come to meet are six lane road, four four lane, and eight lane, which ma which makes a congestion uh, problem in traffic. So uh, it is missing Parisian uh, Parisian uh, lane and cyclist lane. Green spaces are to be maintained, and missing uh, the organized space for taxi stands. And the opportunity, what we found uh, uh, opportunity is one side of the road widening has already already been done, and the other side is still left. So uh, the imp implementation can be done. And the trait is that restricting uh, restricting the high-rise building, although there are high uh, economic opportunities. So uh, similarly, we did the Kalanki choke also. Uh, now, uh, after that, we, we went through how to give new direction to tourism infrastructure along the ring road of Kathmandu. Based on the literature reviews and the SWOT analysis of Koteshwar and Kalanki, so the strategies were developed to give new direction. So uh, junction development, public transport inter uh, interchange at the junction, traffic infrastructures, uh, traffic island and greeneries, bylaws, encourage self-drive tourism, maintenance of infrastructure and corporate responsibility. So this is, uh, we have just tried out some solutions at the junction. Uh, we don't know whether it will be possible to acquis uh, readjust the buildings within the corner. Uh, like open spaces at the corner or corner has been developed. Mm. The, and this one, the, 
This corner, corner is towards the Kathmandu Tinkuni, and uh, road extension is going go, going to start over. Uh, will start over here also. But uh, when we, uh, if we add up the service lane and uh, readjust the adjust the existing building by, I think land pooling, land pooling or house pooling can be done over there. Uh, uh, in order to develop an open space which is livable, which will be livable and create, uh, we can uh, implement the uh, um, things over there. So similarly, in the quotation, uh, uh, Kalanki Chok also we propose like this. Uh, so the junctions, uh, junction squares that has been created uh, by land, uh, re land readjustment or building readjustment. Squares are facilitated with the tourist facilities, communal, communal and public transport, uh, tra taxi stands, trade and service facilities, including craft, gastronomy, restrooms, active leisure spaces, open space, curious, curious shops, etc. Like in our Darwar squares and the corners of market squares or parties like that. The urban elements embedded in the uh, to improve the image of the city and livable built environment. The squares would function as socio-cultural uh, socio space of the area, multi-purpose use at different time of day. So uh, the another, uh, another strategy that we used was public transport interchange at the junction. As we know that all the uh, you know, buses uh, to Bhaktapur also go, goes from the bus park and uh, to other outside the country also goes uh, goes to the by bus park. So uh, there is always a ju uh, junction mm, junction crowded with the bus coming in and out. So we developed the interchange bus park at the, uh, with smart transport system that is the communication for the buses going in and out of Kathmandu Valley at Koteshwar Tapu Road and Kalanki Road will also help to improve traffic congestion at Koteshwar uh, Chok and Kalanki Chok. Yeah, five more minutes left. Okay. Um, traffic infrastructures like bus stops, uh, overhead breeze, on the ground subways, um, traffic lights that are already there, uh, but uh, they are not according to the norms, I think. And that's why we, it should be developed according to the norms. And uh, overhead breezes, overhead breezes uh, that, are, uh, that are already there uh, shows uh, no identity. So if it is designed as the gateway or gateways, gateways to the destination, then uh, it will give some, uh, some uh, cultural or view of the uh, city they, are, they have visited. So bus, uh, bus stops designed as a party of traditional cities of Kathmandu Valley. Uh, another feature is traffic islands and greeneries. We can see greeneries and traffic islands uh, around our road also, but if uh, it has it has to be designed with a norm, so uh, so it acts as a longs longs for intersection and reduce carbon footprint at the intersections. It uh, it gives visual please, pleasing to the junction also. Heritage is not just a physical entity but it is also a physical manifestation of our community pride and identity. And for us Nepalese, heritage and tradition is something that is interwoven in the fabric of our daily lives. Um, it is also our brand as a nation. It is how we represent ourselves to the outside world. And it is also one of the ways in which the outside world uh, recognizes us as Nepalese. Um, so tourism is something that is uh, the government is always seeking to boost tourism and put uh, tourism uh, as the forefront, as the driver of national economic development. Uh, and heritage is obviously a very important dimension of tourism sector in Nepal. But the tricky thing about tourism is, uh, while it can be very, very economically beneficial, if it's not managed properly, it can lead to uh, 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 destruction of the heritage entity itself and put strains on the heritage entity and the local community itself. Um, so on top of that, uh, we as a nation are still struggling to rebuild after the uh, 2015 earthquake. Uh, so given the whole scenario, I think we think that it is very, very important to critically study what is heritage tourism, what it entails, so that it is in alignment with the conservation and preservation of heritage 
and so that it is also beneficial for its people. Uh, through this paper, what we have tried is to study the parameters of sustainable heritage tourism and to provide possible sustainability indicators specific to heritage tourism as a means for sustainability assessment and driver in the tourism processes. Um, so beginning with heritage and heritage tourism. Again, what is heritage? Uh, heritage uh, has a very vast broader meaning. It has been uh, changing uh, throughout the decades, but the most accepted uh, definition of heritage would be it is an asset passed on from generation to generation that has a significant value. It can be tangible, intangible, or natural in nature. Um, it is not just a window to our past, but it is also a roadmap to our present. So it defines the community, its development, tradition, and culture. And what is heritage tourism? It is um, obviously the oldest form of tourism in the world. Um, and it is also uh, the, the tourism in which the tourists or the visitors uh, go to a different place, go to a new place to experience the heritage and culture and have more better understanding of it. Um, so beginning with heritage tourism in Nepal, or tourism in Nepal, uh, Nepal opened its door to tourism after the 1950s, and since then we have uh, seen a steady incline in the number of tourist arrivals. However, the major roadblocks uh, would be the Maoist insurgency period and also the 2015 earthquakes. Uh, but in the uh, year to, uh, 2018, we saw, uh, we hit the magical number. We, he, we had one billion tourists arriving in Nepal. And in the year 2020, we are seeking to double the number. And the world, world, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, we have four of them, is a major allure for tourists. Uh, and our rich architecture, culture, traditions, pristine nature, friendly people are the top drivers for tourism. Uh, and again, like I've mentioned before, we are again struggling to rebuild. Uh, most of the seven monument uh, zones uh, in Kathmandu Valley were uh, damaged in the earthquake. Uh, 33 monuments were uh, severely damaged and around 105 monuments were partially damaged. And uh, we, uh, we have like constant threats to our world heritage site status. We are constantly trying to uh, maintain it, um, which is uh, the threat is mostly due to haphazard of urbanization and weak governance. And I think the uh, rebuilding process from the earthquake is adding to the process of uh, loss of architecture through loss of uh, vernacular buildings and replacing it with modern uh, concrete architecture. So heritage tourism, uh, like any form of tourism, entails both challenges and opportunities. The opportunities would be, uh, like in any form of tourism, economic gains. Uh, it provides business opportunities, it provides uh, employment opportunities, it provides tourism-related benefits of all kinds. Um, and since heritage is at the center of heritage tourism, and since heritage is a, a non-renewable asset, uh, it has to be conserved and preserved. So heritage tourism provides the, uh, uh, provides the motivation and the resources for heritage conservation. And also it provides a branding for a place. It provides an image and identity for the place. Um, the challenges are obviously if the number of tourists exceeds then the bearing capacity, um, there are risks of over-exploitation, strains in the resources, and there are also risks of uh, changing the heritage to suit the taste of the tourists, which could lead into the loss of authenticity. And for many varied reasons, uh, uh, gentrification is also a problem so in terms of Nepal, the opportunities uh, from heritage tourism is obviously economic gains. Many tourism-based businesses and employment opportunities have been created because of heritage tourism. In the fiscal year 2016 and 17, tourism sector in Nepal contributed to 7.9% of the uh, GDP, national GDP, which is expected to be increased by 4.3% by 2027. So Nepal has a tremendous and incredible potential for tourism, which uh, still has been relevantly untapped compared to, the, to our neighbors. Um, and heritage is a major contribution, contributor towards conservation and preservation of heritage entities, uh, especially in the municipality that have uh, heritage entities. Um, heritage tourism uh, contributes to a major chunk of municipal finances. And it has also helped in create a branding for our nation. We are known as the country of the living goddess. Kathmandu is known as the city of temples. And 
Buddha was born in Nepal is, I think, an overreaching uh, branding for our nation. Uh, the challenges of heritage tourism in Nepal would be, since the World Heritage Sites are so alluring for the tourists, uh, the focus, more of the focus in conservation and preservation has gone to uh, uh, World Heritage Sites and tangible monuments, which means that the intangible uh, heritage has been overly, largely overlooked. Um, and also uh, the loss of uh, privately owned and uh, community buildings uh, is also loss of heritage, loss of vernacular architecture. Uh, gentrification is already taking place. A pattern is already seeing early signs of gentrification because of uh, rise, in, uh, rise in land prices and uh, facilities for tourists taking over. Uh, all of these affects the local community, obviously, uh, who mostly are not uh, welcome, uh, mostly are not involved in the process of decision making for the tourism development process while they are in the forefront of bearing the results. So moving on to sustainable heritage, I think in this context we really need to understand what is heritage, sustainable heritage tourism. For that, it is very necessary to understand what is sustainable development. Uh, Bertrand reports that sustainable development is one that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, so in terms of sustainable heritage tourism, sustainability would mean that um, tourism that provides a uh, high level of satisfaction for tourists and tourism-related uh, services while not compromising with the heritage entity itself or the local community and adding more value to it. We have also identified three pillars of sustainable, sustainable development. First one being economic development, which means that development that is beneficial to the local community as well as helps in heritage preservation and conservation. Uh, second would be environmental protection, which means that uh, actions that do not harm the natural environment of the heritage entity, but rather helps uh, it foster. A third one would be socio-cultural development, uh, which means that uh, tourism does not harm the socio-cultural activities or practices of the local community in any way, but would rather help in bringing an understanding and a tolerance for it. Uh, so, uh, we need to understand that sustainability is a continuous and ongoing process. We never reach sustainability. Even if we reach it, it is a continuous process. It has to be looked through. Uh, so, there has to be a system of constant evaluation and measures, uh, and for which the key uh, stakeholders need to be uh, reminded again and again, the information has to be provided to them again and again, and they have to be brought to the table of decision making again and again, for which we think that a strong leadership is necessary. Hence, we uh, identified the fourth pillar, which is the governance pillar. And then moving on to the indicators of sustainable tourism. These are the indicators which tell us if we are moving in the right direction of sustainability or not for which we have to understand firstly what are indicators. So indicators are parameters or even sets of information. Uh, in case of sustainable tourism, indicators would be uh, sets of information that if there is not a process of uh, tourism, sustainable tourism uh, in the way, it helps to form that process. And if there is a process already in place, it helps to uh, measure and evaluate the process, bring in the key stakeholders, uh, evaluate the uh, key risk factors and uh, the best indicators does exactly that and also provides the information in bite size which means that we can have a clear vision of the issue. So measures and expressions of indicators, how are they measured and ex expressed? Going very quickly through it, we have quantitative and qualitative measures for that. Uh, the process of development and implementation. The first process, the first step is obviously research and organization, where we collect all the information, we identify the key stakeholders, and after processing all the information, we uh, have a pragmatic vision for the uh, tourism development or the tourism entity itself. The second step would be indicator development, where we identify the key issues and the, key and the most relevant indicators for that issue. We do data inventory uh, from the first process. And the last process would be the implementation process, which is again continuous and ongoing. 
Um, so indicators of sustainable heritage tourism uh, uh, is something that has been explored a lot in many uh, literature that has been uh, tried and tested in many case studies. Uh, the World uh, Tourism Organization in 2004 released a guidebook uh, no, for uh, uh, indicators. Probably you have five minutes left. No. Thank you. Uh, indicators for sustainability. So in this paper, what we have tried to do is identify indicators for sustainable heritage tourism that are, sustainable, uh, that are specific to cultural heritage and have them aligned with the four dimensions, four pillars of sustainability we had identified before. So our process was firstly to identify key issues for each of the dimensions, uh, then identify the most relevant indicators, and then also spell out the measures for the indicators. Uh, so very quickly, um, uh, we ha I have presented only one key issue for each of the dimensions. So for economic dimensions, the key issue could be effects on local economy, for which indicators could be provision of local employment or effects on sales, promotions of local goods. And the uh, measures for that could be revenue from local craft and souvenir sales per year and also effects on sales, promotions of local businesses. Uh, for social dimension, um, key stakeholder attitude is a key issue. For that, there are several indicators. And uh, focusing on local public safety, the measures for that could be percentage com of community protected by regulations and the total number of crimes reported involving visitors. For the environmental dimension, um, the major key issue is environmental management system. There are a list of indicators for that as well, the most important one being green and sustainability measures for which the measures could be percentage of businesses participating in energy conservation programs, percentage of energy conservation, uh, consumption from renewable resources, and could be something as simple as water saving, which is expressed in terms of percentage reduced, recaptured, or recycled water. Um, the government's for the government's uh, dimension, the key issue is effectiveness and efficiency of planning process of management. Um, a list of indicators for that as well, uh, focusing on measures of built heritage preservation and conservation efforts. The measures for that could be number or percentage of heritage buildings demolished with heritage value or number of buildings and or districts listed on endangered site list or structures. So I'd like to conclude by again repeating myself the key points. Um, so. Um, Sustainability is attained when only there's a balance between the demand and supply side. For heritage tourism, demand side would be obviously tourism and tourism related services. Um, supply side would be heritage entity itself and the local community to whom the heritage belongs to. So traditionally the focus goes more to the uh, demand side, the tourists and the tourism resources. But if we do not focus on both of the sites equally and try to balance it, uh, sustainability cannot be reached, which also means that the stakeholders from the supply side should be invited and should be in the decision-making table for, the for tourism development. Most of them, I don't know. <laughs> I have become so old. <laughs> so once again, we learn, we were taught that heritage and tourism is very important for Nepal and the role of Architects is very big. Uh, that has been repeated again and again. One of the very striking part of this session is we have got very seasoned architects, very young, aspiring architects with a lot of dreams, and then all of them combined took us to a journey from to the all geographical region of our country. This is very specific special for this season. From Tarai, middle mountain, and you know, high mountain uh, on the inner Himalaya. Now basically, uh, it was about Lumini, and very much emphasized on Mustang and Manang, and some uh, in Kathmandu Valley Ring Road, and then when young architects talk about the indicators for sustainable development, not only for tourism, it can be applied for other also. And it's a very unique uh, opportunity that all of this has something to do with the Malaysian interpretation of heritage and modern development. <clears throat> now, uh, coming to Mr. Wise's uh, 
presentation, I would like the organizer to distribute that paper to all of us, all of us. And for those who have never been who have studied alumni, this is a very good document in the sense that it covers all the historical data in very few pages. Uh, he was not satisfied with some of the development that has been doing in Lumbini. And he has uh, indicated about the Buddhist circuit right from Ramgram in Parasi to Kapilvas to Tilora Court. It's a Buddhist circuit. <coughs> uh, talking about Buddhist circuit, uh, this is a very good idea because tourism cannot develop in isolation. Or if it develops, it has got very certain limitation, let's say. So, what, when it was thought the Buddhist circuit came into the mind of our colleague, that how, what will join, what will unite India, Nepal, and other countries, so that tourists, tourists who come to India or Nepal can have a continuous tourism circuit. So there is only one thing that was visible to us as the Buddhist circuit. So there, and it was in Nepal that this was devised, where Sikkim, India, and then Nepal was combined in the Buddhist circuit. And then although Pakistan and Sri Lanka also showed their interest, it was, they were very far, so it was not included. And now, the Buddhist circuit has become so popular that the, the Prime Minister of Indira, uh, India, Mr. Narendra Modi, has also had a plan of Buddhist circuit inside India. So, he was talking about the, uh, so we, a lot of things that not, has not been done in Lumbini, but with Mustan, there are a lot of concern that our friends showed. Very beautiful photographs, I think. <coughs> And then, so the problem uh, with, with it is that <clears throat> this is a place in conference where you show your dissatisfaction. So, if you cannot do, at least you can talk here. If you talk, then 50% of your job is finished. So, I thank, I thank all of them who show their dissatisfaction on what is happening in Nepal. Now, uh, in Ring Road, uh, very, very detailed study has been done, but please remember, if you beautify the ring, uh, ring road, that is not the solution. So what do you see when you drive along the ring road, you don't, you don't enjoy what you see left, what you see right. So, so as I told that architects has a lot of things to do. It's not me who said, the presenter said a lot of things to do in the beautification, in the conservation of our heritage and peace you know, will help in development of tourism in Nepal. And Mustan, a lot of things, so a lot of development is going on. Now, how to treat with the tourism development there? Now, yesterday, Mr. Popo from Indonesia talked about Bali. We have got many approaches. It's up to us to choose. There is one Dubai, which is, has gone a different way, and Bali, a different way. Now, it's up to you to choose among them. Or, if you are, are terrible, you choose, you balance them. It's a very difficult job. So, just talking about Bali has done very beautiful things. Dubai is also a very highly developed tourism destination nowadays. So, don't go after Mr. Popo or Mr. Yak and Y. I recommend have your own judgment and choose one of them or both of them. So that is so all the, the, the Sir, benefit uh, of this conference. I request you to conclude is, no, the benefit the of is this up. conference is that you have that opportunity to learn off. So uh, this was very, so I have nothing to say. That's, that's, that's what I learned from, from them. Uh, and thanks to our very uh, dream, uh, architects, new architects with dreams. And I hope we will try for it. If we couldn't do it, they will do it. Thank you. In fact, we are a little late after so much construction already going on. But this is one of the best things, and I'm very thankful to Mr. Shio uh, Dipak Joshi for coming today again, because he was very interested in this topic. Uh, we need more interactions in the coming days. 
As we know, um, Nepal has a very good architectural history. 800 years ago, our architect was taken by Chinese Emperor Kublai Khan. 800 years ago, uh, and uh, when, when Earth was just, the world was just moving, we had our renowned architecture in China. And he was among most powerful person, among the most top 10 powerful person in China at that time. So architecture and Nepal was long time, very, very rich. We had the history. Despite the geographical isolations, our structures are unique. And still, till date also, it is very widely appreciated. Uh, like me being a tourism entrepreneur, less than 30% tourists who come to Nepal would go for trekking or other activities. More than 70% people would come to our Darwa squares, our ancient uh, architectural buildings, temples, appreciate more than 70%. So the work has already been done. Now, now I think from here we need to move ahead with development and modernization, of course, but not destruction. Uh, just uh, to just share, uh, we had a road expansion in uh, Naya Bazar area and the Sorokote party was gone. A historical thing, maybe not of very big significance, but it was a historical thing. Now it is done. Modernization, development was done, but whoever has planned that uh, removed the Sorokote party for nothing. So in coming days also, I would request all of you guys to be a bit careful about how you do your planning, your design. Despite all the international change, Dwarika Hotel is the most valued property we have in tourism today. And uh, we are proud of that. Despite of all modern structures, Dwarika, the old structure is the most highly acclaimed and we pay the most. That is the most expensive hotel in Nepal at the moment. So uh, you guys should keep it in note that uh, whatever you're planning, it should have some of our local thing, local incorporation, because we are very rich in it, and uh, we should not miss it. And also going uh, forward, uh, we need new destinations. But where are these destinations going to come? Uh, we are removing, removing the Jolungi pools, uh, building the new ones. But the uniqueness of Jolungi Pool can be incorporated somewhere in your work. Uh, Bandipur was not even a destination a couple of years back. But it became a destination because of its architecture value. I believe everybody uh, of you must be knowing because view you can see from Nepal, you can see beautiful views from everywhere. But Bandipur today has become a destination because of its architectural history. So in the same way, I would like you guys to come up with new ideas, new destinations, and new openings, a new Arnico for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. To them that have been sent here, and let them select what they want to answer, you know. Because I don't think we have time, more time, more than that, you know, time. So I'll start with Kai. Let me roll out the questions to you. So, the, okay, what inspired you to use uh, the term Disneyland for Great Lumini? The word Disneyland brings into our minds a world of entertainment and recreation, not a religious one. That's number one. So, why is the modern Nepalese context shifted from ethnocentric concepts to xenocentric developments? What can be a rational response to this trend in the contextual stability for Nepalese architecture? Please elaborate on the design competition to present Maya Devi Temple. The idea of uh, using the word Disneyland, which of course is very catchy and Maybe that's why I was selected to present. <laughs> uh, in connection with the, the second question, I'll answer that in the next conference. It'll probably take me uh, a year to figure out what that actually means. But uh, in connection with the Maya Devi uh, temple competition, um, there are different opinions on how to deal with this. 
uh, the structure that has been built there had a certain concept uh, which I believe were based on very good ideas, but uh, it's, it's not a long-term solution. Uh, it's a heavy steel structure which is rusting and uh, it'll last another decade, two decades, but we need to already now start finding a solution of how to replace it. And uh, the question was, how do we do this? In the previous uh, design period of what was now built, uh, there were all kinds of crazy designs that were presented. And uh, there's, again, uh, there's the idea of having an international design competition, uh, while others believe that that would lead into more complications and awkward situations than actually trying to find uh, the proper solution for a place like Lumbini. Uh, I think this discussion will continue. Uh, possibly we will have the international design competition and hopefully we do get a wonderful design that is appropriate for Lumbini. Thank you. If so, how can we ensure our dir um, direct economical commercial benefits for the locals? That's the first one. Second one is, as we talk about tourism infrastructure, what can needs to be done to promote use of local building materials and local architecture, for example, in case of Loman Thang, promoting use of rammed out technology. Third is, may I request you to highlight on the required adjustment in the existing bylaws and policies of Mustang and Malang as to retain its natural environment. I don't know if there are any bylaws in Malang and Mustang, but uh, 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 monastery restoration project, we had to uh, restore some part of the rammed earth and there was no one in the village who knew the, you know, technique anymore. So we had to find, you know, go around and find people who, who still, you know, remember how to use rammed earth. So, um, you know, it is very difficult to ask people now to build in rammed earth anymore because, I mean, it's very labor intensive and uh, a uh, mud break or stone is much faster. So that's a challenge that's not, not only faced by, you know, Lomantang, anywhere, anywhere else in, uh, in the rural area now, the traditional building materials are being replaced. Um, so that's about rammed earth. Uh, so another question. Uh, bylaws. Um, so far there is no bylaws in Upper Musang or in anywhere in Upper Musang uh, and Lomantang. There is, um, you know, there is no requirement for getting any permission to build. So any anyone is allowed to build in their own land. So um, uh, when we talked with the municipality, uh, the rural municipality uh, last summer, they did mention that they they want to start thinking about bylaws because the way the bill, uh, you know, the the city is expanding. So eventually, hopefully, there will be a bylaw. But there is a student uh, in Kopa College, he's doing his master's in uh, Lomantang, Shekhar, so he's going to do his thesis on, you know, proposing uh, building bylaws for Lomantang. So that's, I think, a first step towards that. Um, Luxury tourism be a solution to the major problem brought by. Mm. Um, I can't really see. I think flooding of tourists is still. It's not yet flooding with tourists. It's still the number is increasing, but you know, compared to the initial stage, it, it has increased a lot. But um, uh, there, there, there should be various options. I think one of the um, way of uh, helping the local community is to um, have homestay. There are many old buildings uh, within the um, wall city, you know, they are still like, um, they, they are, some are like completely empty or some have the opportunity to be converted into homestay. I think this way the local community will benefit and at the same time we, we can have luxury hotel for tourists who can afford, or the trekking tourism, uh, or high value tourism, like, you know, being promoted in. So I think there has to be different options for different kind of uh, tourists. I think that's it. It's great if you're looking at it, but uh, so those are two questions, you know. Uh, thank you for the question. 
The first one about the amenities that we can provide in airports that represent Nepal and its people. Uh, one thing is adding amenities into the airport, but uh, another part of constructing something of such national importance is uh, preserving what we already have. Uh, for any uh, project, uh, uh, especially for these large-scale projects, we really need to see the impact we make on the environment. And there are two types of impact. One, which it makes um, during the construction process, and one after the construction due to its function. So here, in case of Nijgard, I think that we are looking at the amenity itself. The forest itself is our amenity that shows the identity of Nepal. So instead of uh, destroying this identity and adding other amenities into our airport, I think the first step would be to conserve these and uh, to look at how we can incorporate this into the design. So other than that, I think to represent Nepal, uh, the people and the culture here, I think instead of like I said in the presentation, instead of getting out from the airport and going inside a box and see the pictures of Nepal when you're already in Nepal, I think you should get to uh, uh, experience nature firsthand in airports by incorporating the uh, nature inside the building and taking the uh, tourists outside too so we can give them uh, nature-related activities from the airport and um, all the hiking spots and we can utilize the strength of our site, the uh, nature to uh, inside the airport and so on. And of course the basic amenities of airport for service and luggage management, everything should be incorporated. But instead of uh, more than that, I think the, uh, the incorporation of nature is very important for this project. Uh, another question is, Uh, yes, this is a very important issue that we have um, because it's really important to uh, think of the groundwater table and groundwater recharge in any scale project and uh, this uh, large scale project will have even more impact if we just go to a site and concrete it up completely with the runways and the pavements and the roads and the buildings coming up. It will definitely have a uh, uh, adverse effect on the groundwater. So there is a solution to this, of course, with uh, technological development. We have porous, impervious asphalt to come up and impervious pavements for uh, roads and footpaths and everything. So I think if we could incorporate those parts into the design, then we can definitely solve this problem of uh, groundwater recharge and concreting of the space. Thank you. Uh, for Yam, Yam uh, uh, two questions. Is your site public or private? Why do you propose lodging area at the side of the lake? Isn't there a bylaw for a setback at the lake? That's first question. The second one is, do you really need the view tower? You say, I mean, the Tineta project say, Taraiko, Yoda project say, government, Ra, Samudai, Bon Sanga, Mila, Gorekotu, Ra, Monango project say, they are called local leaders, and government project. Oh, I mean, the lodging facilities provide Gorda Kiri say, I mean, this is cost of money. Our mighty one, a good thing, you is to is the tower, like I mean, they use Gorda, I mean, it's like Konza, but revitalized Gorda, I mean, they are tourist life, and you go tourist life, and some way tourist life, and a kissing go. In the new experience created by the Sopsu, Satsapi community life, Penny Oda Kissing involvement, Gorana Sopsu, one is the Tarikal Sami, a new lodging facility, site created a destination created by the Golaiti, or the important Baku Karan Gothari, Monang, myself, especially Monang Mazaki on the Hedi, Tanirate, 
यहाँ पर जाने बेटी के त्यां मनं विलेज मासो उन्हें रिबॉस में पड़े तीन दिन को लगी कि न वन इत्यां को त्यां पर फोर्टर थोरंग लापास करने को लगी अंतिस पर सिटी लिस्ट जाने को लगी उन्हें त्यां बॉस में पड़े थे भूखने का आदमी का लगा रही यहाँ निर्देश चाहिए लॉजिंग फैसिलिटी दियो वाले चाहिए मेर मेर विचार में अलग उन्हें लाई एक ही सिम को यूनिक एक्सपीरियंस के लिए ढूंढ जाओ स्टाइल आया रहने से त्यो त्यो की सिम को प्रपोज कर के थे यू नो डिफरेंट पीपल ऑन अ मेडिटेटिव टोन दे फाइंड दिस प्लेसेस वेरी स्पेशल बट इफ वी गो एंड बिल्ड यू नो व्यू टावर्स वे� so uh, what I'd like to kind of share is that uh, as architects, you know, not necessarily all the time you have to go and make a statement, you know, of building another building or another, you know, form there. And uh, when you go there and spend time and uh, absorb the place, maybe the definition of architect for you would kind of come down a little bit and you may find another meaning. So that's, that's what I felt and uh, I'm sure all of you will have different feelings. Uh, regarding how uh, a building fits into the site is that once you walk around the site and you see, you know, the different, uh, uh, the different way the uh, shape is, you know, it's not rectangular, it's not square or a box. You know, there is a certain fluidity and a certain uh, freedom that the contours have. So I think if you understand that and try to uh, respond to it as best as possible, that is, uh, you know, half the way done. But if you just enforce an idea, you know, like there is, uh, there are some buildings that are there which are very, uh, I think it, it, it was a Korean project, a radio project, which is very beautiful architecturally, but it's not used. And I think the functionality of uh, doing a mega project, uh, I feel is, is, is a paradox. You should do a, uh, you should do a project which uh, almost fe feels like a home. It should. I, I would feel that going there, I would not want to see a big Hyatt hotel happening there, you know. And I think this, uh, this, uh, uh, this feeling is also now in Ladakh, they've just opened it up with uh, lifting of the Article 370. Uh, there is this uh, big uh, scare that, you know, when we have the road coming into Mustang and when you have uh, Article 370 being lifted in uh, Ladakh, uh, it means that there's going to be massive change. So, like Pakhtapur uh, reveals that two-thirds or 67% of tourists go to them not to see temples or monuments, but a local way of life. So why focus on monuments only? Um, tourism promotion requires strategy, marketing, networking, service orientation, not only take, talking about living goddesses or public monuments. Um, yeah, I, th I think I do agree with the statement. I don't think it's a question. Um, uh, tourism or tourism-related industries um, and even uh, conservation and preservation has to uh, broaden their vision more than uh, the tangible monuments. We also need to focus on the intangible sites as well because uh, they are so interrelated. They are vastly interrelated and in most cases the tangible monuments exist because there is an intangible heritage or intangible culture related to that monument. Um, so obviously the focus has to be uh, uh, varied and in different places. And can I provide an example of how four pillars are functional in any heritage sites of Nepal? Um, I don't think I can. <laughs> uh, but I could point out that uh, amongst the four pillars, I think the most weaker one uh, in the present scenario would be the government side, governance pillar of amongst the four pillars. Uh, which is sort of the driving force for the uh, rest of the pillars. Thank you. Uh, for the wonderful presentations they gave and uh, the two panelists for offering their uh, very insightful and penetrating impressions uh, on this session. And, uh, you know, we have covered a lot of ground, as I said, you know, from talking about uh, entire regions that has the potential for, you know, uh, very, you know, um, sort of uh, for development, the future, uh, which within a small, in a small country like Nepal too, we have extremely, uh, you know, diverse sort of uh, situations and potential. Uh, the Lumini, of course, uh, 
the, 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 the Lumini uh, paper, uh, I mean, uh, potential Lumini that was uh, explained by Kai and uh, the, the sites in Mustang and Manang, which were uh, beautifully presented by Sirish and Soros. I mean, they all offer this, uh, you know, their entire regions that yet to be fully developed and explored for this, uh, for tourism. Uh, they offer a lot of potential, but they are also, they, we also saw the very different kind of uh, situations and concerns and challenges, you know, uh, for which we need to, you know, think further and, you know, and, and, and be creative about uh, solutions. Obviously, the same kind of policies don't work everywhere, as you see the extremely different, diverse uh, situations in, and challenges in each of the regions. Uh, in regarding infrastructure, we saw two interesting presentations. Uh, one on the airport, which is also of, uh, a very important, um, I mean, it's one of the main concerns, a critical infrastructure deficit in the furthering of tourism development in Nepal. Uh, so there was an interesting talk on that. Um, of course, from the very visible infrastructure like an airport, which is really uh, um, images a whole country or cities as all these new fancy airports are coming all around the world to a more sort of mundane but much more uh, equally significant one like the ring road how that can be developed should be developed rather I think you know uh, as pointed out very nicely as something which can facilitate tourism in the valley you just uh, you know right now it's a mess you know so uh, that also was a very important, uh, I think, topic that was presented here. Um, similarly, the, you know, Yam, he, uh, I mean, brought out a very interesting issue, you know, uh, you know, as architects or designers, uh, how can we, uh, uh, you know, how can we build our understandings or experiences uh, and, and offer fresh sort of visions and, uh, new sort of uh, ways of looking at architectural design uh, rather than especially in the context of tourism where we see a lot of imitation happening you know I mean this I guess part of the branding you know of a place uh, but I think beyond branding and beyond imitation we need also to be innovative and creative because uh, the imitations and you know and the branding that it supports will work for a while when the new brand will come along, you know, and, and you know, that the, maybe the traffic will move elsewhere, you know. So we have to also uh, uh, try and understand uh, sort of the, the, the roots of the development of, of, of architecture in, in a place and, and, and offer new visions, you know, uh, which, you know, can add to the richness of architecture that already exists there, you know. Um, and uh, lastly, you know, the last speaker, you know, gave a fairly broad you know, uh, overview of how we need to uh, sort of sync tourism development potentials with uh, the actual social, socioeconomic development in the many places. Because sometimes with, uh, you know, the increase in tourism development, there are also, you know, uh, many problems, you know, Related to the environment, towards socio-economic development, that also emerge as well, and I think both need to be looked at together for to, you know, offer a long-term benefit uh, to the people. So with that, you know, you know, once again, thank you very much, all of the audience, which you know, who sort of sat through this long session, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, sort of participated very enthusiastically with. This, you know, lo uh, the, all these questions that will sent here for the presenters. So I'd like to thank you all as well, and uh, just go for lunch. Thank you. Uh, so now, for <clears throat> uh, I would like to call upon Architect Anjumal Pradhan, uh, the President of Society of Nepalese Architects, to kindly hand over the token of appreciation and khadas to our session uh, session chair
now I'd like to call Artik Santa Namalakar. I would like to call out to the Yam Bahadur Hadi Magar. I'd like to call upon architect Sarush Pradhan. I'd like to call upon architect Nasala Tulader. I'd like to call upon architect Prabina Shrestha. To give a summarized presentation, I would like to invite on stage architect Arun Dev Pant, former secretary of Society of Nepalese Architects. Balance between tradition and modernization. And VIP's, uh, VP Zone 4, uh, Union of International Architects, uh, John Ruhan, in his first visit from Korea, felt that it was not only Nepal's mountains and famous historical structures, but also the mix between the old and the new that was admirable. And the CEO of Nepal Tourism Board, Deepak Joshi, pointed out that Nepal's natural diversity and architectural grandeur has always been the main attraction and cause for increasing investment. Secretary and Minister of Culture and Tourism, Kedarabadar Adhikari, talked about connectivity and infrastructure as key aspects and encouraged innovation by developing hill stations and entertainment zones. So I guess that's good, good news for us because there's a lot more work coming up. Keynote speaker Popo Dennis provided us with a glimpse of Bali's recent uh, transition from a traditional settlement into a tourist destination. The key to creating the image of an idyllic getaway that attracts high-end tourists from the world over is to preserve and work with the natural beauty of the place. The key decisions that have worked in this favor include the avoidance of high-rise concrete beach towers and limiting the building height to that of a coconut tree. That I remembered, 15 meters. This could be a lesson for our upcoming destination in Dolpo, Rara, and Bardia, as it is too late to be adopted in Pokhara, Lakeside, and Chitwan. He pointed out that in an architecture derived from clay, bamboo, and soft stone, the concept of conservation is the transfer of skills and traditions to the next generation more than the transfer of the buildings themselves. His presentation was full of designs that showed transformation of traditional architecture into modern luxury while keeping it all within the confines of the surrounding nature. High value with low footprint destinations that could be a model for Nepal. So the Minister of Urban Development uh, Mohammad Ishtiak Rai focused on reconstruction of historical sites and traditional settlements and said that he looked forward to recommendations from SONA. He also has assured to take on the agenda on the formation of a Council of Architects. SONA President Anju Pradhan gave a brief outline of the institution's objectives and her commitment to further establish chapters in all provinces. Special mention goes to the convener, SCAF President Rajas Thapa, for elevating the stature of this event by using his knowledge and skills garnered over a lifetime of volunteer work in all our institutions. So thank you, Raya, sir. So the day one technical session was imaging of the city. And there is an excellent uh, reporter report that is available. We have got perception of local residents in areas such as Khandruk, Bandipur, and Saura, along with the drivers of change such as conservation policies and friction between tourism and local economy. Architect Rebecca 
uh, categorize the various types of tourism and mention the difference between religious tourism and pilgrimage, a necessary prerequisite for undertaking such type of projects. Architect Roma Amatya, Vijay Krishna Shastra and Babita Thapa presented images of a historic city settlement of Chobar, also in the light of reconstruction and conservation of efforts, which unfortunately have been hampered by impractical bylaws and guidelines. Architect Rahul Pradhan talked about public space in Kathmandu Valley and images they create and gave valuable suggestions such as removing the boundary wall in uh, Tunik Hill and pedestrianizing the road between Ratna Park and uh, Rani Pokhari. That's a very novel idea. I think it is worth ex exemplary. Architect Niranjan Shrestha and Pariksha Singh explored the architecture for cultural tourism by focusing on Kirtipur and its streets and vantage properties and also the challenge of shrinking footprints brought about by division of property. Panelist architect Bhuvati Man Singh mentioned that Kevin Lynch's image of the city should have been referenced by the presenters, which was a basic book in our architectural and planning studies. And panelist Mahendra Saki, a tourism entrepreneur, talked about creating better value for encouraging higher paying tourists that need to be housed in better facilities. The next uh, session, Technical session was chaired, which is poor, theme was post disaster, and the session was chaired by architect Sudhir Bhakta Sangache. And Dr. Vijay Krishna Shrestha, with Porth Earth Earthquake Housing Reconstruction, included successes and failures supported by data and anal analysis. Lack of proper supervision being the key drawback to a more successful implementation. Architect Poonam Mascaranas highlighted the significance of traditional architecture in the modern context. She encouraged activism by architects by involving the larger community to take on plans that are targeted towards the profit motive of developers at the expense of tradition and identity. Uh, architect Anatta Shrestacharya said post-earthquake heritage restoration in Kathmandu and specifically on Kathmandu Kastamanda restoration with local community involvement. Architect Manjari Shaikhi presented the images of Bar Park pre and post earthquake and explained that the systematic breakup of the old settlement pattern due to residents' preference of newer materials and structures. Architect Yatra Sharma, along with paper present by Shristina Shrestha and Lumanti Joshi and Basundara Marjan, talked about their experiences working with local communities from design to implementation. And panelist Bharat Sarp pointed out that conservation is not an impediment to development. Uh, the next day, which is today, the technical session third in the morning was fairly long and it says new direction in tourism infrastructure. Session chair was architect Bidesh Shah and architect Kai Waise brought to the fore the Disneyfication of Lumbini with the monasteries trying to compete with each other for building higher and taller and suggested that more attention to be paid for the local context while designing. Architect Saifuddin bin Ahmad highlighted the blending of the modern and traditional in Kuala Lumpur, again showed the tendency to build taller and bigger can be at the expense of heritage and identity. So this theme keeps on repeating, as you have noticed. Architect Sirish Bhatt uh, to, uh, talked about tourism infrastructure development in Upper Mustang and time to think of alternative approaches to tourism infrastructure that do not permanently change the landscape and the settlement patterns. Architect Santanwa Malakar provided an overview of airport development in Nepal and stress for the need of culture and development environment to be respected when proposing this fa these facilities. We don't need the biggest airport in Asia, she said, but the most eco-friendly airport in Asia. And I think we should uh, applaud that sentiment. Architect Yambadur Radhi Magar and Raju Rai looked at the opportunities and challenges to tourism infrastructure development and proposed that the architect's responsibility lies not in recreating eclectic vestiges of existing architecture. So the next, uh, the last se the se session, second part uh, is not, sorry, there's a mistake on that new direction. Architect Sarosh Pradhan, concept of sacred visions for the Himalayan region assumes that adding uh, anything negatively impacts the pristine and spiritual landscape. A more measured approach would be to learn from the settlements, maintain a spirit of the place and innovate. Use caves as existing tourist facilities, for example, ex existing caves. Architect Nasala Tulader and Smriti Dungana discussed on the development of the existing and the proposed ring road and the necessity of adding tourism facilities at various points and also an attempt at making more identifiable through various elements. Architect Prabina Shrestha and Sharmila Shrestha 
talked about impact of heritage tourism on heritage conservation by using indicators of development using the four pillars of sustainability. Panelist architecture Devin, architecture Devin Lagongol encouraged the newer generation to forge ahead while protecting what we already have. And panelist Bishwes Shrestha, a tourism entrepreneur, said that the products that reflect heritage are the most valued in their line. New destination and innovations, however, are required from architects. So now we would like to come to a resolution based on the theme of the conference. And these are the resolutions we have proposed and it has to uh, go through the approval process. One is heritage and traditions are sacrosanct and are to be safeguarded for posterity. Special zones for high natural value within the protected areas of Nepal need to be identified and special development uh, guidelines or, or controls or uh, may, I think, is Bidesh there? Uh, better terminology? Okay, <laughs> to be formulated for such areas. Due recognition and involvement of local communities are to be ensured for undertakings of sensitive nature. Number four, high value facilities with low development footprint to be encouraged. A national consensus needs to be reached on the way forward for Lumbini and perhaps even Mustang, keeping in mind the sacred nature of the natural site at Lumbini, as well as the sacredness of the site at Mustang. So this is, I would like to thank you for your patience and listening, and also for understanding how we have come to the resolutions. Thank you very much. Committee board, I think you whole committee members, the pani ununsa education institutions are bada. Sabai ko equal dedication bada. I think you book publish bhai ko ho. Isma I think oily lai think how bada college ko articles thesis articles are ucha. Each college bada I think amro tinta thesis topper arko thesis articles I think publish bhai ko cha. So total I le athar bada I think thesis article are ucha isma. तर इसको मोटी बनने को तो क्यों बंदे ही नॉर्मली हम रोते हैं जी सरू चाहे अपने कॉलेज हर को साथ ही अल्ली मात्रे नहीं है ना अपने कॉलेज बीस में मात्रे सीमित होने हो ना लेते हैं सब ही कॉलेज को तो एक बुक में छापी ना है रीते हैं सब ही लेते हैं कसरी क्यों ये कुलम हरुरान बैठा है था कसरी प्रोजेक्ट्स ह आज यो एजीएम अथवा कॉन्फ्रेंस में लॉन्च करना पाऊंगा तो ही देरी खुशी लाए कुछ और सब पे कॉलेज को सार में मलाई तो देरी ही देरी थैंक यू बनना तो हंसु अन्य बार सर वहाँ से यो एडुकेशन कमिटी को तो चेयर पर्सन होने सा थैंक यू सर अब तो लॉन्च करने वाला रेडी वन टू थ्री वन पला Thank you. अन्य ये से संग और कुछ करें अपनी मत अपना चाहें तो कॉलेज को लाइब्रेरी हरु और थेसिस स्टूडेंट्स हरु और इसलाय इन कॉलेज गानों लाय मत सब ये इवन प्रोफेशनल्स हर लाइफ वाली मौत से रिक्वेस्ट करते हैं ये बुक किन दिन होला क्योंकि कंपलीटली स्टूडेंट हर को इन कॉलेज बन को लागी हो सो आज को लागी थे आज को लागी पहले से इसको प्राइस थाउजेंड रहेगा था हम मैंने अब ये फर्स्ट एटेम्प्ट हो शायद मंगो बायो कमेंट पनी आने सुनो पढ़ लेते हैं उनसा होला तर नेक्स्ट टाइम देखिए जब मास प्रोडक्शन उनसा शायद इसको प्राइस घटना चाहिए सक्षम होला तो इसको कंटिन्यूटी पची पनी हो सबे कार्य काल में हो जैसे आशा रखते हैं थैं real big jack pocket of goodwill because I never I'm a floor person and all of a sudden here I'm on high pedestal they have so it's out of goodwill that they have to, I think only criteria that I very strongly meet is that perhaps among the all the mass here or definitely among the Nepalese I'm the eldest person so that doesn't make me wiser than anybody but nonetheless, that is a criteria perhaps that has put me in the high pedestal of being the so-called chief guest. Normally, in our part of the world, here also, it started with the minister coming and sometimes uh, the closing ceremony. We have again minister, I don't know how it goes in your 
part of the world in your country, we have certain uh, hero worship kind of situation where we like to call the minister and then only all the media person and all bunchy around. So that is the kind of, you know, high gimmick thing. Uh, whereas this has become really down to earth. So thank you for your... Thank you. From Bangladesh, representing UIA, International Union of Architects. I wear two hats. I'm also the co-director of SDG Commission, where Nepal also in the steering committee. Sudeep from Nepal represent Asia. I feel privileged today. I'm standing now in one of the city that has the most influence of culture and heritage in the world. Next February, the whole world is gathering in Abu Dhabi at Wall Urban Forum 10 to discuss on heritage and culture, the thing we've been discussing last two days. And the culture lead development in cities for the world. This is the right time I came here. And thank you, Sona, for arranging such an event. Uh, not only right time for the Nepal, but also for the globe. Union of International Architect SDG Commission is also arranging a program, a networking event on culture and heritage in February, 8 to 13 February. I invite you all to join there. Let me thank you, Madam Anju, Suraj, and Sona Council member for inviting me here. Last month, most of you were in Bangladesh for Arkisha. I met few of you. This is my fourth visit in Kathmandu, but I did not have chance to see outside Kathmandu every time I was inside the room. But last two days, our speakers taken me to the great places where I missed. This is an amazing journey, I think, we all had shared. I wish I could take all the speakers with me to Abu Dhabi to tell the world what heritage and culture means here. Anju said, Knowledge shared is knowledge gained. This is truly reflected here in this conference. I take serious note of that from my friend Popo, his statement, how the ignorance of cultural identity in cities cause placeless and faceless built environment that I think after this conference Nepal will have a true face, Kathmandu will have true face of a truly original urban life. From the discussion on Barbak, Ranipukuri, uh, Kastamanda, Kitripur, Mastang, Bandipur, Panchkal, I would like to take four points with me to the global audience. I came here to take all the lessons learned from here. One, number one, culture and modernity that we discussed here today has conflicting grounds. We have to address the spirit of cultural heritage preservation and also embrace the contemporary modernity through professional and political intervention. Number two, the short-sighted economic motive do not prioritize the preservation of culture, heritage in our urban development scheme. So we need to formulate a new people-centric investment plan. Number three, preservation of people's life, livelihood and cultural heritage has to be placed at the center of our imagination. Architect has to meet these challenges by introducing new ideas of heritage, culture, 
inclusive urban solution. Last two days, we have seen, we have talked about problem and we need to come up with the solution, the innovation solution. I would like to see after many, many two, three years, we'll have some solutions. Lastly, architect of the region should follow the landscape of region. Dr. Varus Sharma said, you have to wear your own color, not the international color. I truly support that. Dhaka should be Dhaka. Kathmandu should be Kathmandu, not Kuala Lumpur, not Singapore. There is a golden word going around the globe is called SDG, Sustainable Development Goal. Today, all the speakers last two days talked many things that all encompass the issues of SDG. And goal number 11 and target 11.4 very explicitly expressed. This has been agreed by all the countries of the world. Strength to strengthen the effort to protect and safeguard the world culture and natural heritage. So this is not only there in the room that we have been talking, it's been an uh, uh, issue of discussion in the global audience. According to new urban agenda adopted at the Habitat 3 conference in 2016, the role of local culture and heritage is a fundamental component of a city. I'm reading from the new urban agenda. Cities with quality cultural heritage yearn for a good investment, especially in tourism business. This is a book I'm going to hand over to Anju. We have published from our SDG commission. Uh, Sudip also have one. I'll, uh, I'll leave it with uh, Sona's library so that you can have it. And also this is, this is an online version of this. I'll, I'll share the uh, online uh, issues. This shows how an architect can contribute in all the 17 goals of SDGs. Even hunger can be mitigated, architects can contribute. In the poverty can be, uh, we can contribute in the, to eradicate poverty. So I believe outcome of this discussion, the conference, will initiate a dialogue among the policymakers, the urban professionals, and actors in Nepal. And I would include my region, our region, Bangladesh, India as well. In UIA Congress in Rio 2020, UIA SDG Commission arranging a roundtable di discussion on how architects can engage in 17 goals that I mentioned in this book. I would humbly request you, I know many of you are already registered for UIA 2020, please join from 19 to 23rd July, we are ha having a program there uh, on SDG. Once again, I thank Sona for warm hospitality extended to me and my son Omio and giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you. Thank you very much. We call it national seminar, but it is almost international. How, how do you differentiate one from other? Because we have so many international guests. So it is almost at the level of international seminar and very meaningful also. Uh, in context of in context of Kathmandu, that too, when we are really at the advent of our tourist 1920, you know welcome arrival situation. I think it's a very timely kind of seminar that Sona has hosted and for that we have there the SDT committee has really worked pretty hard, pretty hard, you know, for this kind of you know event to be held in a smooth and almost perfect way is not a joke. It is really a hard thing that we have seen. So Anju, thank you so much, you know. Your SDG committee has done a wonderful work. Uh, now, our keynote address person from Indonesia. I studied architecture in Malaysia, and that, that was the time when our French president was Bankarno, Sukarno. 
he used to be called Balkarno, you know. And uh, he talked a lot about, you know, Balinese architecture and uh, his uh, really ecological approach in uh, tackling the various, basically, hospitality building is very quite com commendable. It is, and he talked about the fusion. I wonder, these days, you know, architects are sometime back when country were really landlocked, uh, Nepal was landlocked. So we are cut off from one country to another one, you know. But now, architecture has become pretty global. But having said that, we have to learn from global experience. But we got to devise a way whereby we still maintain our identity. And for that, the heritage part is pretty essential because that is hard. How could you forget your heart and soul and then uh, talk about albos only? How could you talk about uh, some other, you know, uh, magnificent uh, edifices in other part of the world? Perhaps we could learn a lesson, but we have, it has to be contextual in our own context. That doesn't mean that uh, oh, we can arrest the time. Nobody can arrest time. By the way, in no way it should mean that I mean to say that Kathmandu should be almost like a Jew. No, never. Some time back, you know, somebody was saying that, do you want to convert uh, Kathmandu into Jew? No. It's a, it's a Jew, but it's a Jew of homo sapiens with a high sense of value for heritage. And I, I guess in days to come, so you foreign guests, you have, most of you have come as tourists as well, to know the place, to know the culture, to know the society, to have a pulse feeling of the society. So please, when you return back, share your experience, whatever you, you have faced here, and talk about that our keynote speaker was talking about fusion of architecture. I was posing him the question, how do you fuse architecture from your part of the Bali and Nepalese architecture, really having tremendous concern for heritage so that we could still maintain our identity, but still there could be a fusion opportunity and avenues of future. So with this note, I think I shouldn't be talking a lot. Thank you very much. The president of SONA, architect Anju Malna Pradhan to deliver the concluding address. Ma'am, please may we have you on the dais. Of knowledge sharing and we hope the sessions were enjoyed by all who joined in. The energy and dedication to showcased by all the helping hands and advisory has led to a very fruitful exchange of thoughts and ideas on the issues of tourism and architecture. Our thematic committee with Professor Dr. Sudarshan Raj Tiwari, Dr. Jharna Joshi, He is here, Dr. Tiwari and Jarna is here with us. Thank you for coming up with the most appropriate topic, title and sub-themes in league with Visit Nepal 2020. Our technical committee with Dr. Bharat Sharma, again Dr. Sudarshan Raj Tiwari, Dr. Jagdish Chandra Pokhrel, architect Vijay Burathoki, who despite busy schedules, put in so much time and effort to review all the papers time and again, so as to get the best out of all. Dr. Neil Kamal Chapagai from afar, who was to be with us but could not make it in the last minute. He reviewed all the papers of the second session to the minutest detail and we look forward to him working with us on issues of architecture education in the near future as for our con conversation and emails. Thank you so much. We were privileged to have so many authors and presenters within SONA and Arcasia member countries. Thanks to all our members who submitted papers. It was just not possible to include everyone this time. The rapporteurs have done an excellent job which will help us to bring out the proceedings of the conference. We will work on bringing out a full book with the papers inclusive of all the professional projects exhibited along with arts and photography submitted by our SONA members. With full support from the entire fraternity, it will be possible to work out more events in the future and we hope all of you will use this stage and forum to share your strengths. The instantaneous support we got from Arcasia and UIA with speakers coming in from four countries, 
Akisia President Rita So herself, Vice President Zone B Arch Architect Saifuddin Ahmed, UIA Vice President Architect John Rul Hang, and Council Member Arch Architect Ishtiak Zaiti Tas has helped in elevating the level of our conference to a new high. Thank you so much for being with us. I would like to name the rapporteurs who are with us behind the scene. Architect Tabasum Siddiqui and Architect Sushmita Ranjit, Architect Shweta Amatya and Architect Ramprasad Sual, Architect Regina Bajracharya and Architect Arjun Basnit. <coughs> we would also like to thank our session chairs, Dr. Mahendra Subba, Dr. Surya Bhakta Sangachi and Architect Birish Shah, panelists who joined in despite last minute calls, Architect Bibhuti Man Singh, Dr. Bharat Sharma and architect Devendra Nath Gungal with hotel entrepreneurs Mr. Mahendra Shakya and Bishwesh Preshta. Mr. Bishwesh Preshta. Immense gratitude to architect Arundev Pant and architect Sher Bahadur Kesi for telling us time and again not to worry about financial issues and to carry on with the preparations. Can't thank you enough for making it all possible. A big round of applause for them, please. Our strong and supportive advisory committee of past presidents who are always ready to help and guide us. Thank you, sir. We would like to thank the very enthusiastic and dedicated team of 22 volunteers from all the colleges who worked till late hours catering to the nitty-gritty of the preparations, preparation process. We had volunteers coming in from Dharan and Pokhra as well. Thanks to our dedicated SONA Secretariat team, Pradeep Khatri and architect Hina Shrestha, for the long hours and dedicated work that you put in. <laughs> Thanks to our media partner, Spaces, Knowledge Partners, Official Paint Partner, Asian Paints. We are also very grateful to our 12 mega sponsors who have been so patiently waiting it out in the courtyard down there. I hope all of you have visited the stalls where exclusively we have one product, one stall. No repetition of similar products this time, covering a wide range of products closely relating to the hospitality business of overall architecture. Our valuable sponsors are Shama Devi Group, Asian Concreto Private Limited, SNJ Joshi and Sons Company Private Limited, Shivam Cement, Continental Trading Enterprises Private Limited, Krishna Trading Concern, Airtech Industries Private Limited, Marvel Technoplast Private Limited, Baba Muktinath Fabricator Private Limited, Rukmani International Private Limited, VTech and Mangalam Group. Thanks to Aloft for the smooth operation of the conference at their prestigious venue. Lastly, but most importantly, I would like to thank the entire family of SONA members for always supporting our endeavors. We still have a year left and we promise to keep delivering more interactive sessions with more inclusion of members. <coughs> Come forth with your ideas and we can sit and work it out together. Let us all work together for the benefit of our professional integrity. Lastly, I would like to thank my dedicated 13th EC team for their hard work, dedication, coordination, sleepless nights, the tough job of working it all out. Here I would like to mention our EC member Abhishek Mananda Bajracharya again, who took complete leave from all other work for almost two and a half months to dedicate all his time for the completion and preparation of this conference. If I have left out anyone, I'm very sorry. I hope I have included everybody here. Again, I would li like to thank all of you for being with us two long days and I hope you have enjoyed the sessions. Thank you very much. May I call the representative of Airtech Industries Private Limited. <clears throat> Marble Technoplast Private Limited, uh, Pawan Kumar Sancheti. Otis Continental Tra uh, Trading Enterprise, uh, Teach Subedi. Sivam Cement, uh, Nikhil Agrawal. Joshi and Sun 
कंपनी प्राइवेट लिमिटेड जीना बैन जानकार Let's give a big hand to each other. Uh, I'd like to make special mention to the international delegates who found time, and I'm very sorry that you, that you came all the way, uh, flying in many hours probably. The closest was from India, but you spent a lot of time at the airport, I believe, uh, probably uh, nearly. 24 hours or something like that, and that makes it even a longer flight. Uh, thank you, anyway, for coming in Pune, and also I like to, you know, thank all the uh, institution heads, professional uh, society heads, who have uh, you know, found time to come at the opening as well as closing. Some of you may have stayed at the, uh, you know, conference uh, presentations. Uh, the two days conference uh, may have been a little bit tight. I would like to have it a little bit, uh, you know, longer. But uh, I would say it was very precise, and uh, the EC also managed to squeeze in the AGM. And I'm sorry if any of you had to wait uh, for some time outside, but half an hour was, I think, the delay time that we we took. Anyway, I. I presume also that uh, today you, uh, the international delegates spent some time to see our beautiful city of Patna, and uh, you may have enjoyed it well. Uh, I take the opportunity also to thank all the uh, all the you know session chairs. I would not name them; it's all in name. The speakers, uh, the panelists, and of course uh, the uh, rapporteurs as well. Uh, the three, the three sessions that were there, uh, all started because of the keynote address that came from Papa Dales. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, well, I'd like to thank everybody who made this happen. I had an army of volunteers, and uh, it was wonderful working with them uh, late at night and. Uh, I used to also send them messages at three o'clock in the morning or twelve, and I used to get the answers at about five or six. It meant that they were working overnight as well. Thank you very much, each one of you. Uh, at the AGM, there were some good words for me uh, by the president of uh, Society of Nepali Thank you very much. But uh, you know, all my uh, I, I also have two very prominent hats. I, I also lead the Society of Consulting Architectural Engineering Firms, and uh, where I have the past president also here with uh, with me. And uh, we, uh, you know, the, the the experiences that we've gained, we, I shared it also uh, in Sona, and uh, I think that's where I want to see Sona also do better than SCAF at most of the time because Sona is my institution and I, I feel that if we can grow this institution further, we'll all, you know, have, a, we'll ha all have something to give to our, our younger generations. Uh, well, the hotel needs to be thanked for the lovely venue. We need to thank uh, the, uh, you know, the the operators of the uh, technical screens that is here, amazing solutions, and of course everybody who played a wonderful part in making this event a success. Uh, I wanted to pick this area, this hotel, because of the of the title, which related to the tourist hub of Kathmandu, Tamil. So I thought this would be a wonderful place to have. Uh, a conference for this title, and uh, it's proven that all of you have accepted it by coming in large numbers. Thank you, thank you once again, and.
Let's enjoy the drink together. Thank you very much.